be given when we are live streaming. Good morning, I'm Councillor Jonathan Lester and I'm the Chairman of the General Scrutiny Committee and I will be chairing today's meeting. Before I start the business of the meeting, I will go to each committee member and confirm that can, they can be heard and can hear. It's a legal requirement for me to do so. If you can please uh, have your video so that you can be seen uh, for those in attendance and for those members of the public who are watching. Uh, please advise me at once if there's at any time during the meeting you experience any technical difficulties that prevent you from hearing or being heard. I will now call each councillor's name in turn. Uh, please speak to confirm that you're able to hear and I will confirm in a response that I can see and hear you. Firstly, uh, councillor Tracy Bowes. Good morning all. Yes, I can see and hear you clearly, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Barry Durkin. Good morning, everybody. I can hear you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jenny Hewitt. Good morning, Chair. I can hear and see you. Thank you. And Councillor Louis Stark. Yes, good morning, everyone. I can hear and see you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we are also uh, joined by Cabinet members this morning. So we have Councillor Ellie Chowns, who's the Environment, Economies and Skills Cabinet member. So thank you for your attendance. Um, Councillor Gemma Davis, the Commissioning Procurement and Assets uh, Cabinet Member, will be joining us uh, later, because she has a prior arrangement but uh, meeting, but she will be joining us in about 45 minutes. And we have Councillor David Hitchener, the Leader of Council, joining us as well. Um, we also have the following officers in attendance. We have Ben Boswell, Nicola Percival, Richard Vaughan, uh, Guy Goodman, and have I missed anyone? And uh, we have Jenny Priest as well, and Tim Brown, helping to make sure things are running smoothly. Oh, and last but not least, um, we're now being joined by Richard Ball, the Director for Economy in Place. Thank you. The Council is uh, video and audio streaming this meeting live on the internet and making an official recording. First of all, we go to apologies for absence. Have I had any apologies for absence? Apologies from Councillors uh, Matthews and Wilding. Thank you. Have we had any name substitutes? None, Chairman. Okay. Next is item three on the agenda, declarations of interests. Uh, please indicate anyone by raising your virtual hand if you wish to declare a schedule one, schedule two or other declarable interest and I will call each councillor in turn. No, right, we move swiftly on to agenda item four, which is the matters of accuracy for the minutes of the last meeting, which was, held, which was held on the 22nd of March. So far, we've had no matters of accuracy uh, non notified to the monitoring officer. Uh, if not, we'll go straight to voting on those minutes. Non-voting attendees will be moved out to the breakout room for a few moments. They will be automatically returned to the room when the all eligible votes are cast. Please can non-voting attendees now be moved out of the room so that we can vote on the minutes. Um, Chairman, could I just add briefly that in accordance with the revised standing orders, um, all votes will now be um, recorded and appended to the minutes of the meeting, just for members' information. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. And uh, members of the public can view those afterwards. Uh, Chairman, we have five voting members and the poll should be on your screen. All votes are in, Chairman, and those have been unanimously accepted. Thank you. Thank you. 
if we can now let uh, members and officers back into the meeting. And just to update all present that those minutes have been agreed. Item five is uh, questions from members of the public, but we have received no questions from members of the public. And uh, item six is questions from members of the council. Uh, but again, unfortunately, we've had no questions from councillors. So we move swiftly on to an update on the executive responses to the committee's waste management strategy review and the review of the climate and ecological emergency. Um, so we will be going to uh, members for their views. And uh, just to note that I think Councillor Chowns, you have a prior engagement that you you have to, so you're, you're, you're time limited with us today. So that's why I've asked the committee if we can comment uh, on the uh, climate and ecological emergency responses first. Um, so we'll be dealing with those first to enable you to uh, leave the meeting when you need to. Um, so without further ado, I'll invite uh, Richard Vaughan, the Sustainability and Climate Change Manager, to introduce the report and then hand over to Councillor Chowns for initial comments and then we'll go to the committee for their comments. So over to you, Mr Vaughan. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Good morning, all. <clears throat> so just to uh, give you a brief background, on the 8th of March uh, 2019, the Council declared a climate and ecological emergency, or a climate emergency rather, following unanimous support for a climate emergency resolution at full council. This declaration was updated on the 11th of December 2020, when Herefordshire Council declared a climate and ecological emergency following support for a climate and ecological emergency resolution again at full council. General Scrutiny Committee established a task and finish group on the 20th of January 2020 to carry out a climate and a climate emergency review. Uh, the task and finish group identified key subject areas of focus for their work. These areas were communication, natural capital, economy and tourism, planning and resilience, community, ecology and agriculture and land use. It was recognised that both waste and transport were undergoing separate reviews and the group sought not to duplicate this work. Both external and internal speakers who were experts in their fields were identified and invited to meetings to present to the group and discuss these subjects. The General Scrutiny Committee met on the 25th of January 2021 to agree the task and finish group report and they made 58 recommendations to the executive. On the 25th of March 2021, the executive responded to the review, setting out a response to each recommendation. The response was developed in consultation with the relevant service areas and seeks to build on existing work to meet the recommendations whilst working within resource constraints. I'll pass over to Ben briefly um, and Ben will then pass over to Councillor Charles. Richard, uh, Councillor, are you happy for me to just jump in? Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, as Richard said, um, I think it was 58, uh, 58 recommendations in total, which I think was a bit of a record for the organisation. So um, it was a, an awful lot in there, really. And and really, you know, huge thanks to everyone involved with it, because in, in pulling together recommendation and the executive response, there was an awful lot of going across the whole of the council, really, to collate that. Um, so big thank you to everyone for that. Um, of the of the recommendations, I believe there was uh, 46 that were approved, either in full or in part. I think it was 25 approved in full, 21 approved in part with slight changes, and then there was 12 recommendations that were rejected. Um, I just wondered, would it be helpful for me maybe to touch very briefly on each of the 12 that were rejected, just to sort of give a, a, a sort of slight explanation to those? I mean, I appreciate that there's the full response in in, in attached with me minutes anyway but just to kind of give a flavor of, as to the rationale for those so yep. if that's okay i'll carry on yes all i would ask is that you do it in order um of the recommendations for the for the purposes of making it easy for our clerk to uh minute yeah of course, of course yeah so um so the first one was recommendation number one which was a, a recommendation for the creation of a, a politically proportionate climate and ecological ecological policy committee now unfortunately due to the current governance models and, and the proposed 
uh, hybrid governance models of the council that's not actually possible as proposed in the recommendation so what the executive response has done is is referred that to the rethinking governance group to consider how that you know how those thoughts and and recommendations within that because there were sub recommendations around the future generations act in there as well so that's been referred to the rethinking governance group but as, as proposed, it's not actually possible within the council's constitution, so that's why that was rejected. The um, now, if I move on to recommendation five, which is around uh, mandatory training for all officers. Now, the council's current policy, a corporate policy, is that only legally required um, mandatory tra uh, training is within the mandatory training suite, um, and as such, the recommendation is that. The current training that is available to all officers on, on climate and environment is strength is reviewed and strengthened and will be promoted heavily to staff uh, for them to take part and undertake that one. Um, if I move on to recommendation nine, which is around faster share, um, I suppose a slightly unusual one because it's termed a rejection because I think the the proposed um, recommendation was actually that acknowledging that not every resident could be supported with super fast broadband that there'd be additional support but actually you know the council's ambition is that we don't give up on on anyone and so it was rejected in a positive light saying actually we're not going to get to that point we're going to solve the issues and we're going to continue to find broadband solutions for every resident so so whilst it's rejected i hope that's kind of understood in in sort of premise there uh moving on to 17 um, that was around the inclusion of the climate and ecological checklists within a local list for planning. Now, Herefordshire doesn't actually operate a local list within the planning system, so we're unable to do that. So that's why the recommendation was rejected. However, there's a commitment within there that if a local list is progressed in the future, it would be uh, included within that. So again, that's just the, the council in its current planning system does not operate a local list. Um, but obviously those checklists are already in use through the planning system and available on the website. Um, am I going okay for time in, in terms of speed? I don't want to rush you through them. Um, no, no, I think you, your timing is good if you touch on them, because I'm sure councillors will want to come back yeah. um, on, on, on all of these. Um, but no, please run through them for the benefit of the meeting. Yeah. So the next one uh, is recommendation 19, which was around uh, manual management plans. So unfortunately, we don't have the capabilities to, to monitor those. That's actually something the Environment Agency need to do because that's where they're enforced. So what the uh, response does say that actually as, as manual management plans are submitted through planning, they will be you know assessed uh, and brought through the planning system. So it's doing what we can within uh, within the recommendation there. The next one was recommendation 21, which was for a supplementary planning document on anaerobic digesters now um, again in a similar way to the fastest year one actually it's rejected but there is a better proposal in there because the new minerals and waste local plan actually sets out new policy that has significantly greater weighting than an SPD would so it's actually a, a stronger way for us to to do that so that's what the proposal is um, recommendation 33 was for uh, the council to propose a water protection zone in Herefordshire um, there are ongoing conversations with partners and the Environment Agency, but unfortunately, the Environment Agency are the only organisation that are actually able to formally request one from the Secretary of State. So that's why that um, recommendation has been rejected. Uh, but it does note the conversations are still being had. Sorry, can we just note that uh, recommendation 22A was reje rejected as well? OK, I'm sorry, I have to jump. Is that the, I was around flooding, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, do you want me to jump back to that, or do you want to come up with that? Do you want to come on to that one after? Sorry, it's entirely up to you. But I mean, we, we we did skip over it, and if we were going in in order of those that were rejected, it must be noted that a twenty two a was rejected. Yeah, Vaughan, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it, it was just to pick up on that. Really, um, the recommendation was that no future development site should be brought forward in any designated flood zone two or three. That was rejected. Um, that's because it's not possible to prevent all development on those zones. 
Um, however, the guidance states that there's essentially a hierarchy that people have to go through and, and evidence why very strongly something would come forward on those zones. So whilst it's not possible to outright ban it, um, it's, it's also not encouraged, if you like. Okay, thanks. Sorry to uh, disturb your flow, but I, th I just think we needed to note that one. Yes, and sorry, um, as I said, I was trying to go through each of the ones that were rejected. There are some that were approved in part, and I suppose within the response. That's why I yeah. didn't intend to jump in. No, no, I just wanted to thank you on that one. Um, so the next one that was rejected was number 37, which was regarding the proposal for a local seal of approval um, around product. Uh, unfortunately, the council doesn't have the resource or expertise to, to resource that at present. Um, and so what, what the proposal is actually that we continue to promote best practice and that um, the team are working to, to apply for external grant funding to support the sustainable food, food plate and to try and create a coordinator there to sort of take forward and, and support that existing work. Um, next one was uh, recommendation 54, which was around the use of an Article 4 suspension for motorsport. Um, now that one, I think there's quite a detailed legal response or, or sort of within the response, so it's probably easier for me not to just tongue tie myself a little bit with that one. But um, unfortunately, that was not quite possible without... It, it, we're not unable to say we can do that across the entire county. It's quite case specific. So it sort of outlines that and the process for that. So the recommendation is to look at it a bit more case by case. Um, hopefully that does explain. Um, recommendation 55 was for the creation of a flood victim support fund as a revolving fund by the council. Um, now, unfortunately, having taken advice, that's not something the council is actually able to do within the rules again. So uh, what the recommendation does say is that we will continue to keep the website up to date with the latest information and support available to residents. Uh, and that will be kept up to date as we, as we continue, really. Um, then recommendation 56 uh, was around looking for further proactive uh, ecological protection of development sites. Um, and so... I guess what the recommendation does there is it notes that the council does have some legislation available to it to do that through the use of tree preservation orders and hedgerow regulations. But unfortunately, there aren't other regulation, regulatory tools that we can use to, to further do that. So uh, I guess the recommendation is rejected because it can't do what's asked in full, but it is doing what is possible within the suite of le legislation to, to available to the council. And then lastly, the last recommendation was the 57, which was recommending that a letter is included to all residents in the council tax uh, around the climate ecological emergency. Now, um, that one was rejected because there was a consideration there are better, better mediums and, and I suppose methods of, of communicating with residents and also the, the negative, the risk of a negative perception of receiving that messaging whilst receiving the council tax bill is, a, you know, having taken comms advice, that would not be achieving the desired effect um, actually so it's about using the, the new partnership that's going to be set up uh, the website and also seeking to reduce paper use um, yes so that was that was the, the ones that were rejected so hopefully that that helps it does indeed and um, neat summary of, of those points um, right before we go on to um, members of the committee to comment uh, on those and in general any of the points they wish to raise in the recommendations uh, and the discussions that those recommendations have generated by the executive. Um, can we go to Councillor Chowns? Would you like to make any comments initially? Thanks Councillor Lester and um, thank you everybody um, on the committee and also everybody who served on the task and finish group um, and the officers who supported the work as well. Um, this is the first time that I've come to a scrutiny committee with an executive response, so um, I haven't prepared a speech, I'm afraid. I understood that we'd, you know, we'd basically have a bit of a dialogue, um, so I'm really happy to engage in dialogue on any of the issues that you'd like to raise. Um, I'd like to assure you that I spent a lot of time working with officers on this executive response, um, sending it back you know, batting it back and forwards several times in order to try and, you know, really respond to the um, very great deal of time and energy and effort that I know everybody involved put into um, producing the original report and this kind of record breaking number of recommendations. So it really has had very careful consideration and I feel very um, confident and positive that the outcome of the work is, you know, really helping to kind of drive forward 
uh, the you know the climate and ecology agenda. So again, thank you very much to everybody involved, and really look forward to discussing any specifics. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, yes, a good uh, discussion. Uh, I think will uh, help facilitate the meeting. So I look to committee members now for their comments. I know they're all chomping at the bit to make their comments, and um, I think it was a. It was a photo finish, but I think Councillor Hewitt got there first, and then it's uh, Councillor Stark after that. Well, it's just a suggestion, Jonathan, actually, because I'm sort of skipping to um, uh, Ben's number 17. So it's possible that other people in the room have one, five and nine to look at. Do you want to just go through the list he gave us and go anybody for number one, number five, and then Tim's got it all in order? Um, if the committee is happy with that, um, Councillor Stark, were you going to make a, a, a general comment before we launch into the rejection? Yes, I was. Um, thank and then, you. Uh, if, if we go to you then, Councillor Stark, yeah. and then we'll go with Councillor Hewitt's uh, um, approach. Thank you, Ben, for raising the statistics that I was going to raise, which does cause me some concern. First of all, background to the TNF group. We spent a year on this. Uh, of our time. And this is a hugely complex uh, subject matter, which has an immense impact on our residents if we don't do something about it. So I have no apology for the 58 recommendations in the report. In fact, you will not be surprised, and I'm sure Councillor Hewitt can confirm this, that there were some that were rejected. We could probably have ended up adding more to it. What I really want to ask is, are we doing enough to take this report seriously? Climate change does not stop because it's not in our constitution. Climate change does not stop because our lawyers tell us we can't do something. Climate change doesn't stop because the planning regulations don't, doesn't allow us to do something. We have declared a CEE quite rightly. And I understand what you said, Ben, about the 12 that rejected. In fact, there's more than 12. The chairman picked up in one, but I think there's another one. And there's 21 being accepted in part. But I want to rise above that. This was a genuine response by the TNF group to what we thought the council needed to engage in as far as the CE and the EE was concerned. And I don't think we should be sitting here rejecting recommendations or accepting them in part. That's a process issue. I think what we should be doing is looking at the report and for the executive to say, well, how do we try and take these recommendations forward? Who do we need to engage? Who do we need to lobby? Where do we need to make the changes so that we can actually start tackling CEE? Because I'm just concerned that this is becoming a process rather than a commitment to actually do something about the declaration we made. These recommendations, and Ben and Richard, you were there at most of the meetings, were considered very seriously by us. And I just feel that just responding in a procedural way is really missing the point. And that's the observation I want to make, Chair, that we should be looking at the 58 recommendations and asking ourselves, well, how do we actually take them forward? Thank you, Councillor Stark. So, Councillor Chams, did you want to respond to that specific point? Yeah, if that's okay, thank you. Louis, I, you know, I completely sympathise. I really do, you know, and I would love, I would love to have been able to come back to this with a report that said that every single one of those recommendations was accepted. I really would. And, you know, I, I tell you, within, you know, within the drafts, I really pushed back whenever I could to get recommendations closer to being accepted. I think... Um, you were talking about kind of procedural stuff. I really want to assure you, from my perspective, certainly from me and from the officers, it, this, this isn't a kind of procedural kind of batting away of the work that everybody in the task and finish did so hard for a year. You know, people have thought really, really hard about responding to this. And, you know, like the, the list that Ben went through there, it's not that we're, I think we're doing what you said. Like, if not saying, oh, no, we can't do that, but thinking, OK, how can we do that? So, for example, the one about mandatory training. Well, if we wanted to have mandatory training on the climate 
crisis, then we'd have to change the policy about all staff training altogether. You know, maybe we will get there, but certainly in the interim, we can do what we said we're going to do, which is review the review all of the, the content of that training, really, really try and push it to everybody. There is a distinction between what's required by law in terms of staff training and what's kind of optional. And so it, I, 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 I don't think, well, I totally kind of empathise with your kind of frustration about the things that haven't totally been taken on board. I really want to emphasise that so much of it has, and even the stuff that has been kind of technically rejected has still prompted an awful lot of thinking and improvements as well. So, you know, ju just wanted to kind of, yeah, contribute that really. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you, Councillor Chance. I mean, if we, if we look at the ones that were rejected, one, one five and nine governance well we know that it's the current governance structure that can't allow for that um so training well we've just heard the explanation for training and of course broadband it's not rejecting an idea of connectivity it's trying to be ambitious about making sure everybody gets there with that but councillor hewitt i think you 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 wanted to raise the point about um recommendation 17 Okay, thank you very much. Um, just quickly to say I'd like to recommend that we go for a standing panel to continue after this so that, um, you know, the recommendations are worked with and um, we can see what progress is actually made. So that's, I'd just like to put that recommendation in at number one straight away, please. But recommendation, but recommendation 17 the local list is a complete bugbear of mine because we used to have one in this county. And I, it's saying something about, you know, when the results of the pass review come through and this, that and the other. We haven't completely heard about that yet. And I don't know what the pass review said. And I don't also know because you never know what people are submitting to a review, do you? So when Ofsted comes along, do we submit just what we think they want to see or do we submit everything? So whether that question was asked, I don't actually know. But the point about a local list is that it makes it possible. And it's sort of saying, oh, well, we might do it in the future or if it's agreed or this, that and the other. We need a local list now because we've got very local considerations in this county. And you know, we have a phosphate issue, which is screaming at us. It's stopping economic development for a whole raft of people. It's polluting our rivers. It will kill our tourist industry. It's completely shameful. And the local list would make a huge difference to actually what we do do in this county. I don't see any real reason in there why it's being rejected other than, oh, maybe jam tomorrow. I want jam now. So there you go. Okay, so you heard the challenge, jam now. Um, Mr Vaughan, did you want to come in or? Yes, uh, yes, yes thank point. you, Councillor Lester. And then and, we've uh, got uh, Mr Boswell coming in as well. Okay, and thank you, Councillor Hewitt, for submitting that beforehand. That was helpful. So Kevin Bishop is on leave, but um, Simon Withers was able to provide a response to your question. Um, which was around the um, impediments for uh, introducing a local list um, and why uh, the local list was dropped originally. Uh, so from Simon, what he said was, in essence, the production of a local list is in our own hands and doesn't require any form of secretary state approval, as far as he is aware, although local consultation and the involvement of the planning portal would be necessary before adopting one. There would be a duty upon us to publish that local list on the website and keep it updated as the guidance confirms uh, status falls away after two years. After that time, the requirements would have no bearing on the validity of applications unless it was refreshed. The National Planning Policy Guidance advises the local list is prepared by the planning uh, authority to clarify what information is usually required for applications of a particular type, scale or location. In addition to being sp uh, specified on an up-to-date local list published on the local planning authority's website, information requested with a particular planning application must uh, be reasonable, having regard in particular uh, to the nature and scale of the proposed development and about a matter which is reasonable to think will be a material consideration in the determination of the application. As such, the council will need to consider carefully how reasonable or proportionate the recommendations might be in relation to the wide range of applications that are received. 
it will need to ensure that the requirement is clearly linked to a material planning consideration and one that is underpinned by a policy reason. Uh, his recollection of the removal of the local list was that it was aligned with the introduction of the 1APP nationally standardised application form and the associated national val validation requirements, which were streamlined at the same time uh, around the year 2008. Local authorities were obliged to respond positively to the government's drive to simplify the bureaucracy of submitting a planning application and a decision was taken to withdraw the local list and rely solely on the national requirements. So what I'm hearing there is, yes, we can do it. So why have we got a rejection? Because actually, you know, it would help us. It's not, I mean, one of the discussions that I've had about this was, oh, it's going to be an impediment to business growth. And we've already got an impediment to business growth and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. This will help us and it will make our county more attractive. And people will want to come here instead of at the moment going, oh, my God, there's this huge stinking river that runs through the middle of it. We need to push it. And I don't understand why it's been put forward as a, as a rejection. It just doesn't make any sense from what you just said. OK, but before we go over to Councillor Jowns for her comment, uh, I would just like to say I saw committee uh, heads being nodding. And um, I thought Mr Withers response was an excellent response. Um, and comprehensive, but there was nothing in there, his response that didn't say why we shouldn't keep doing it. Um, you know, it made perfect sense to me. So, if we, oh, Councillor Durkin, and then we'll go to Councillor Chowns. Thank you, Chairman. Just to say, um, if you look at the response of rejection, the final sentence says, oh, well, okay, if you ignore what I'm saying, we, we can do it, but it's got to be in accordance with the PAS review. What sort of response is that? We've either we've got a problem, we've got a solution, it's worked before, why not make it work now? Okay, Councillor Chowns. Thanks. Um, Jenny, I'm with you on Jan today. <laughs> um, I, I just want to highlight that, that maybe we're getting tied up in the word rejected, because if you look underneath, under actions, there is an action to review the opportunity for a local list and to do statutory consultation on a local list. So, you know, what, what, what officers are saying are, yes, you know, we will look into setting up a local list. We can't agree to put it into the local list. That's why it's rejected, because we don't have a local list, but we're going to look into setting up a local list again. And, you know, as you know, and as we've covered in various other recommendations and responses, we're already doing a lot of work on other kind of dimensions of planning, sustainable building standards, we're doing, you know, intensive livestock units and water quality SPGs and so forth. Of course, planning legislation is all a bit up in the air at the moment, and we're going to go into our own core strategy review. So it's all kind of on the table. It really isn't a kind of mm, no rejection. We are going to look into it. I would be supportive of kind of saying, OK, well, Kevin Bishop, can we look into it slightly more quickly than by January 2022? I would be perfectly supportive of that, although I know Kevin has got an awful lot on his plate. Um, but 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 yeah, it's it's really not a blanket. No, it's a yes, good idea. Local lists. Let's look into it. But there will have to be a statutory process for setting one up again. I sense that Councillor here, you want to come back on that point. Uh, well, what I understood from what Simon Withers was saying is that there doesn't have to be a statutory consultation. It is up to us. Am I right in what you read out, Richard? I think he I think he actually says in there that it's not a statutory consultation. Did anybody else hear that or am I? So which means that it should be down as accepted and that there's a process that's going on in order to do it. So I do not want to see rejection there. I want to see that changed. OK, so we, just, just for clarification. Clarify. Yeah, if we go to Mr. Ball for clarification. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Ben Boswell also indicated he wanted to come in, but uh, I think I think we're probably getting hung up on the detail because uh, the recommendation 17 doesn't say there must be a local list. It, it talks about um, where certain compliance checklists should sit in the pre-validation stage of planning applications. So I think what um, what the executive response talks about is it's the technical rejection of that specific recommendation, but then goes on to say 
uh, will work uh, on reviewing the, the need for a local list um, and um, uh, consider setting that up as part of that process. So I think you know it, it's not saying we won't have a local list. What it is saying, but what it is saying is uh, that that specific word, the wording of that recommendation was rejected and then goes on to say, but we'll progress developing a local list. I think so, therefore we've got a accepted in part and a rejected has slipped in um, by mistake. Uh, Councillor Durkin. You covered my point there, Chairman. It's going back to what Councillor Stark said. This does smack of a bit of um, process. There could have been something else inserted, a rejection part or some, some modification to it because it makes it clearer that the whole thing has not been um, considered appropriately. It is just a rejection. I've got another overarching concern, but I will come to that later on, if I may, Chairman, regarding the, both these reports. Yes, but it's, yes, okay. It, 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 it should not be just a process. Let's look at how we're going to achieve something. Okay, um, we've got Councillor Bowes next. Sorry. Um, I think maybe a recommendation should be then that we get this list a, a local list produced before the target date of January 2022 so that we move forward with it sooner. So I'd, I'd like to see that as a recommendation. Okay, there's second recommendation. Right, okay. Um, Mr. Boswell, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I, I couldn't find the raise hand button earlier, so I was waving a little bit. Um, I suppose I was just going to reiterate a little bit what what Richard Paul said actually, I think in terms of the recommendations, unfortunately there is a process to how we have to respond and that, that's what's dictated the, I suppose the template and, and the use of the words approved, rejected, rejected in part, I mean uh, approved in part, that, that's why they've all been termed as such, so unfortunately that there's a process to having to give a response in that, but hopefully as, as you see the, the commitment there is to take it forward. I suppose it's also just wanted to comment that the intention, I think, of the recommendation is to make sure that the work is out there and, you know, influencing planning and making the difference. And actually, I just wanted to say that those planning checklists, you know, have been created. They, I think they were taken through the task and finish group. They are adopted. They are live on the website and they are making a difference. So I, I suppose, you know, they, they are already out. I just wanted to make that, that point. It's not that nothing's happening. It's that we've got them out as quickly as we can. They're working in the system, making a difference. And there's a commitment there to see how we might do more with that. So I just wanted to, I suppose, say that. Noted. Uh, thank you. Right. Okay. Um, did we, have I got any more speakers, committee, very specific points? We're going through the recommendations where we're going through the ones that were rejected. Um, any any more comments on the, the list of rejected ones? I want to make, raise a point about uh, the recommendation 54 um, about the Article 4 direction, but um, did anybody want to come in and comment on rec other recommendations uh, lower down the list? Right, Councillor Stark and then Councillor Hewitt. Yes, um, Chair, there's one we missed, which is recommendation 30D, which has got a rejection against it as well. Um, in the task and finish group, we had a really interesting debate with Monmouthshire about verge management. And it just seems to have been lost uh, in, in the discussion we have today that we should be doing more as a county to encourage education of how we can manage, manage our verges better rather than just simply cutting them every time we feel they need cutting or responding to residents who say they need cutting as I get off and I'm sure others get as well. So I'm just conscious that we've got 30D there, which was a genuine attempt by the task and finish group to spread the knowledge that is already there in Monmouthshire about the way they are managing their verges round our parishes in Herefordshire. We're not even looking to the county to necessarily take the initiative here, but to at least get that information out to parishes so they can be far more proactive locally 
because they have the local knowledge about verges in their uh, in their districts. So I'm just a bit disappointed that's been rejected uh, without even thinking about it. Can I also yeah. say that it would have been quite possible to talk to Verging on Wild and to ask them whether they would be give a, a webinar to parish councils, one webinar that any parish council could dip into. And I don't think that question has even been asked as far as I'm aware. I don't know. Uh, okay, well, we'll go to Councillor Chowns. Yeah, I agree with you both. I, I think this one slipped through the net somehow. It's not an expensive proposal. <laughs> We've got Verging on Wild who do brilliant work and actually Verging on Wild are now working really closely with Balfour Beatty on verge management. So um, yeah, I don't see why this should have been rejected. So yeah, we'll fix that. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll make that as part of our recommendation. recommendation yes, Chair, we'll to, recommend, to, yeah. um, gently push back on that, seeing as there is the opportunity to spread the good messages about the initiative. Okay, uh, Councillor Hewitt. Okay, I'd like to go um, to the rejection of recommendation 19. Um, Chairman, Chairman um, can, I, can I interrupt there, going back to that one that we've just, we've just been talking about, 17, the, the D. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, Councillor Hewitt, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry Councillor Hewitt. Um, just to say that this was started under the last administration, towards the end of the last administration, consulting with parishes to determine where bees can, can best be left, how the verges can be uh, looked at and protected, safety reasons excluding, of course. But this was in full flow towards the end of the last administration, and parish councils were accepting it and were local groups. So I'm surprised that A, it has been continued, and B, it, it, it got through as being rejected. Can I respond briefly? It, it's certainly not been rejected or stopped at all. The work has been uh, carried on and deepened and strengthened, as is obvious to everybody with all of the uh, notices that go out for, for protecting local road verge nature reserves and so forth. So, yeah, we'd like to reassure you on that count, Councillor Durkin. OK, but you'll you'll have a recommendation from Scrutiny Committee to reaffirm that uh, position. Uh, Councillor Hewitt, apologies for the interruption. That's fine. So I'm pretty concerned about manure management plans. And I know that we have um, some some statements going into the minerals and waste local plan. And I know that we don't currently have the resources to enforce. But I'm concerned that we're going to put a statement in there which implies that we're being proactive by saying on the planning portal that they will be assessed. Because in my experience, the use of HRA, which takes into account cumulative impact and therefore would look at manure management plans, has not in the past, and I think there's been a bit of a sea change where this is concerned, because I've been looking at um, planning applications as they've been coming through. Ha it hasn't been understood that almost all of Herefordshire basically has HRA attached to it, because we have been saying that there's a moratorium on building in the lug area. But in fact, you know, the point about whether something has cumulative impact is the case whether or not the river is failing, because if you continue to do something which will affect an area that that already has damage, and then you continue it in an area where it's progressing towards damage, you are going to have the same effect, which means that HRA for most, you know, for most applications needs at least, at the very least to be considered. And I'd like there to be a statement in there about HRA and it's, it's, um, its network throughout our county, because that's where we can make a real difference. And I would also like to point to later on in the, in somewhere in one of these recommendations, it says that there are um, regular discussions with the Environment Agency. Now, I don't know about these regular discussions. I know that they come up at the Nutrient Management Board, but I don't know, and I don't know whether they're publicly available what those discussions are. And actually the people in this county need to know what progress is being made on those discussions with the Environment Agency. It's a national issue for all our rivers, as we know, if we look at any of the maps around there. But for the people of Herefordshire, their, their um, 
style of life, you know, what they've chosen, how they feel about this county depends on us really cranking down on the on the on the authority on the statutory authority which the environment agency has so i'd like to see those meetings public i'd like to see a less woolly statement and i'd like to see hra acknowledged as being actually one of the things that probably needs to happen throughout our county thank you councillor hewitt uh, richard vaughan did you want to come back on that particular point yeah, thank you, Councillor Lester. Um, and again, thanks to Councillor Hewitt for um, submitting a question around those meetings uh, in advance. That was very helpful. So Steve Hodges got back to me this morning uh, regarding uh, the council chairing regular meetings with the Environment Agency. Um, you'd asked how often are the meetings happening? Who is party and are the meetings public? Uh, so the response from Steve Hodges was that the meetings take place monthly. Uh, notes are taken of these officer meetings, which include representatives from Herefordshire Council, Balfour BT Living Places and the Environment Agency. They aren't public meetings as sensitive property level information is often discussed. Um, Councillor Hewitt, you'd like to come back can on I, that? Can I just, did he mention at all whether those minutes are publicly available or are they all private minutes? No, he did not. I'm afraid uh, the final sentence says they aren't public meetings as sensitive property level information is often discussed. So how will the public know where progress is being made? I'm happy to take that one away, Councillor Hewitt, and uh, report back if appropriate. Yeah, it refers back to Lewis, Lewis question at the beginning, you know, that's this, we need clear process that the public can can weigh in on, can go, right, you know, I'm going to vote with this. I'm going to put my energies behind this next time I vote. It's really important. Councillor Hewitt, can I, can I ask you to just um, perhaps think about a recommendation then in terms of ensuring that there's, you know, it's noted that there may be confidential items discussed, but um, without any information about the, these meetings, then it doesn't seem to be communicating to the public what they may need to know. Councillor Chance. Um, thanks, and uh, Councillor Hewitt, I really appreciate, you know, the tenacity with which you pursue these issues, I really do. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and um, on HRA, it would be really helpful to have, you know, some wording from you and stuff that you want us to specifically look at. On the question of just public meetings and private meetings, I just kind of want to share my sense that, you know, we, we do have public meetings. You've mentioned the Nutrient Management Board, for example, Councillor Hewitt, and that is a public meeting. It's broadcast live. Members of the public and others can come and, and, and councillors can come and ask questions. And that is, you know, that is the place of accountability. Um, my experience within the council is there's all sorts of non-public meetings that happen behind the scenes. And that's kind of normal business. That is, that, that does have to happen sometimes because there are sensitive things being discussed. But I just want to emphasize that there is a format, an existing format, it's the Nutrient Management Board. And from my perspective, it is very helpful to have members of the public and interested councillors attending those meetings, submitting questions and holding agencies, you know, and ourselves to account for really kind of making progress on tackling these really dreadful pollution issues. Mm, can I just come back? Um, I absolutely agree. But like the golf course, many of these private meetings are the places where positions are established and stances held. And then they come to the Nutrient Management Board. And I have been to the Nutrient Management Board several times now as an attendee. But um, my feeling is that lots of the positions there are severely entrenched and it's just like a playground standoff half the time. I mean, I think you possibly agree as far as that's concerned. You know, agencies shifting is, is um, it's like tectonic plates. It makes a big difference as to how those conversations are being held. And the pre-conversations are often the ones that dictate what goes on in that room. So my question stands about whether those, Richard, if you don't mind, whether those minutes can be publicly available, at least in an acceptably, you know, obviously private things about possibly money and contracts and stuff can't be shared, but there should be something that could be shared, okay. Councillor Bowes. Um, just coming on to Councillor Hewitt's point, maybe the recommendation could be that information on progress uh, with, with regard to these private meetings, the non-confidential data could be shared at the Nutrient Management Board level 
and then everybody would be aware of it ready for the meeting so that that information the minutes could be shared or pointers from the minutes could be shared at that that meeting and the confidential data um excluded just just as some sort of recommendation and um I don't know if I've come in too early, Chair. I've got a point on uh, recommendation 41, but I'm happy to wait if that's not in the order that you want. Well, um, going through the we're going through the recommendations that have been rejected uh, so wait. far, and uh, number 41 wasn't on my list. But no, um, it, it hasn't a recommendation. No, so, are there any more comments on the the, the rejected? Recommendations. Um, right, okay. Uh, Councillor Stark. Yes, sorry, Chair, I can't remember which recommendation it is that was rejected on the water protection zone. I mean, this follows on from Councillor Hewitt's point. I'm really concerned, I think the TNF group was concerned that we have no single owner of the River Y. You could say that the River Lug as well. I mean, it makes us quite impotent as an authority in some respects, in that the, 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 the damages that have been caused to the River Wye, we don't seem to have a great deal of influence over how we can avoid it, other than through these discussions. And I think the TNF group felt that we should seriously consider a water protection zone because that would give teeth, I think, to us in terms of bringing some some tighter regulations to what was happening to the River Y, And I really would like to open that up for a discussion now, because I know it's been rejected, but I really would like to really get the group's views on whether we should have a recommendation to push back on that and to ask the executive to pursue it further. Right, can we, before we do that, can we just be clear on which recommendation we're talking about? It's 33. Uh, 33? Yeah. Yep. Right, so comments on 33, but we've got uh, Richard Vaughan and then Ben Boswell wanted to come in and then we've got Councillor Chowns as well. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Yes, it was just to clarify that recommendation 33 requests that the council urgently seek council advice regarding the implementation of a water protection zone, not that we implement one. Um, now that was rejected simply because um, the council's own legal team is able to provide that advice that was sought. Um, so essentially it was just in terms of efficiency that meeting has already been held. So in the response it states that the, the, the council's legal team have provided the advice requested um, in a meeting on the 5th of January, 2021. Um, so it was rejected, but it was because actually it could be done internally in it and it has already been done so. Okay, um, again, it's just that use of the word rejected um, that seems we seem to be struggling with here. I think, I think that I'm going to put forward a recommendation mm. about how we reject things mm -hmm. and how it's worded. Um, Councillor Stark, you wanted to come back yes. on that. And um, then we've got Ben Boswell. It goes back to my original point, which um, I think Councillor Durkin has already commented on, that we seem to be getting tied up in process. We... We, we were advised, I, I suspect, by officers to put that recommendation in the way that it was put. I, I can't remember precisely. But I do remember, and I'm sure Councillor Hewitt will back me up here, that it was the wish of the TNF group to seriously pursue the implementation of a water protection zone. There's no doubt in my mind that if we look back at, if we had a recording of our debate, that that was our original intention. And Chair, since we are having this, and I hate to use the word wash up, since it is about a river, why? But since we are having this wash up today, I would like a recommendation that was much firmer than the recommendation 33 from the group to ask the executive to look at how, how they could achieve implementation of a water protection zone for the river. Okay. Can we go to Ben Boswell first and then go to Councillor Hewitt? Thank you, Councillor Lester. So I suppose Councilor. I just wanted to so I just wanted to touch on the, on the, I suppose the proposed response in 33 because um, as, as you know th there's an awful lot going on to try and improve the river quality. Uh, the council's taking quite a 
a really a very proactive stance on on how we do that. So uh, we've been working on the interim development plan, looking at, at developing wetlands, working with partners, taking a very leading role in the uh, NMP, and then and also there's you know, other conversations going on. I think the action there is for, for myself to to work with deferate uh, local MPs and to write to the Environment Agency on this issue. So it's not saying nothing's going to happen. It, it's saying you know. As written, the recommendation was rejected because of the wordings. And yes, we have got caught up in process. But the, the response is a proactive one that says, OK, we couldn't do what's asked. This is what's going to happen. But just I, we, we, I think we've just touched on it a lot of times. The process of how we respond to these has taught, tied ourselves in a knot here saying we're objected, not doing anything. That's not the case. Um, there is conversations going hard that are pressing forward but legally it needs to be the environment agency that ask for the water protection zone that's not something the council can do itself um, so that's why the, the action is to work with the DEFRA agencies environment agencies to have those conversations okay uh councillor hewitt then i think councillor Jones, you wanted to come back on councillor hewitt first yeah okay so um my thinking is strategically that if we really stick our heels in and say we are going to be pushing for a water protection zone it might unravel the stasis that happens in the room and the nutrient management board because if the agencies like the nfu or the um, any of the sewage companies or any of the possible polluters in the room think that they're going to have an even more restrictive um, plan coming forwards, it just may help shift the game in the room. And I think that that's really important because I, I was talking to a farmer and he was talking about the legacy phosphate, which he's been working on for 12 years on the Garnston estate. It's incredibly difficult to shift. And one of the suggestions that had been coming forward from one of the agrochemical countries and get this, this would be awful in Herefordshire, is to spray carboxylic acid on the land in order to not add more fertilizer, but make the, de the, the degraded soil, which hasn't got the microbiome or the organisms to bring forth the phosphate, the legacy phosphate, to release that legacy phosphate from the land until we find another solution. The only solution is a soil strategy, which we've talked about. But the point is that when I spoke to him, he said, well, the only solution I can see for phosphate in this county is a water protection zone specifically directed at phosphate. You know, because the nitrate vulnerable zones, which is what the planning department has been relying on to control phosphate, is just ludicrous. That's from NE. It doesn't make any sense at all. So I really would like to see, not a rejection there, as we've talked about, it seems to be a clumsy approach to stuff, an acceptance in part and a commitment to sort of really firm up, okay, well, in the event of us not being able to shift the dialogue here, a water protection zone, that's my recommendation. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> Councillor Chams, did you want to come in or should we go to yes. Councillor Stark? Please, yep. just to clarify. Yes. So the yep. word rejected is clearly wrong here. It should say accepted because we did seek council advice <laughs> urgently on the 5th of January. So it's been accepted and done. If a recommendation comes for the council to implement a water protection zone, that would have to be rejected because we do not have the powers. It's out with, you know, we can't do it. It's not our power. It's an environment agency power. But if there's a recommendation, which is what we've basically read this recommendation as saying, to campaign for a water protection zone, to do everything we possibly can to protect water quality in our rivers, absolutely, yes, and, and that's what we're doing. And, and we are, you know, exploring, trying to push the Environment Agency and the other players, because this is a wicked problem, this problem of the pollution in the rivers. It really, really is. We are trying to push all of them to find solutions, including, as you say, pushing for a water protection zone. But I just think let's not tie ourselves up in knots with more recommendations that ask us to do things that we can't do. But, you know, we have done this one. It should say accepted. And yes, we are campaigning.
Okay then, so maybe it's that we tailor make the recommendation to encourage the executive to continue or fully support them or something like that, rather than uh, give them um, a recommendation that sounds like they're doing something, they're not doing something that they, they are. Uh, Councillor Stark. Yes, um, can I go back to my original point at the beginning of this meeting and ask the executive, given the discussions we're having so far, to go back and review all of these recommendations and, and the responses you gave, because it's clear from these discussions, Chair, that we've picked them up wrongly in, in respect of what we felt they were. And I really do think they should just look at them as a whole again and, and make sure that the final executive response reflects what the executive is trying to tell us. That's all I'm saying. Okay, and uh, Councillor Chance? Just to clarify, um, the use of the word rejected, accepted in part or accepted came into the process very late on in the drafting of this document. And I think that we've highlighted two cases where the word rejected was used and it should have been accepted or accepted in part. Um, very happy to go through and review you know, those lists of rejected. I don't think we need to review the entire thing I don't, because actually when you look at the detail of the actions that we're gonna take and what the document says, you know, that's what communicates what we're actually gonna do. It's just that this word rejected has been a bit unfortunate, yeah. And before we go to Richard Vaughan, I, j j just to make the point that obviously as a public document, it really matters the way it's presented uh, and it, you know, if it gives the false impression, I don't think that helps anyone, let alone members of the public who are trying to understand what the committee's done and what the executive is actually doing as a response. So I think lessons learned here is um, the way that the progress is being represented and, and presented uh, matters a lot here. Uh, Mr Vaughan. Thank you. Yeah, it was just to add to this conversation really. Um, the, the accepted and rejected are very literal. Um, I think that's what's come up in these conversations um, where recommendation 33 is a really good one because specifically the task and finish group are asking the council to seek council advice. That was rejected. We won't be doing that because the legal team have already provided that legal advice. Council is, is separate. Um, and so I just wanted to be really clear as to why these, these um, accepted, rejected are very, very literal. So that it isn't that it's incorrect, this is correct, but obviously what we're talking about is the essence of the recommendation is being taken forward. And that isn't captured very well in a one word response. And that is why we have that text below, which says what we are doing. So you're right, rejected doesn't really represent what the answer is saying, but it is technically correct because the council won't be seeking council advice um, because it has taken the appropriate advice that it needs from its own legal team um, in that meeting. So just a small clarification there. It, it, it sounds like we need a, to introduce a, a neutral uh, term like noted, and then the explanation would then explain that rather than rejected because it does rather sound like a, a, a red line being crossed through the idea. Um, we, we, we've just been joined by Councillor Gemma Davis. Can I just check that you can hear us and see us? Yes, morning Chair, I can see and hear you. Thank you for joining us, you're very welcome. Um, right, okay, we had uh, Councillor Hewitt. So um, the recommendation, Tim, for number 19 is to encourage the executive, well, this is my suggestion anyway, to explore all solutions to protecting the River Y catchment SAC, because it's often referred to as the Y SAC. And it and it what happens is the catchment gets excluded from that. And then and then to finish that statement, including the possibility of a water protection zone in collaboration with the Environment Agency or something like that. Does that make sense? Do you want me to send it to you, Tim, instead of you writing it down? Okay. That would help, that would help. Cut and paste, that would help. Right, okay, so we're still working our way through the recommendations that were rejected, but perhaps haven't been rejected um, in the way we think they have. Um, it's the devil is in the details. So any, any more comments um, on the rejected ones? I, if not, I just wanted to land up 
on the recommendation 54, that is where I think there is a rejection in the sense that, it, well, well, is it? Um, because what it's saying is greater work would need to be done and probably more area specific than a whole blanket approach. But I do not see anything in this explanation as to why it shouldn't really be taken forward because there may be, it, most of the description says, well, yes, there's a process to be followed and yes, there's lots of work to be done and all of the process, but there isn't necessarily in there for me an argument is to say, well, we shouldn't explore the possibility of actually doing it, especially when, if there is environmental harm that could be um, as a result, of something that's not controlled, then uh, you know I do think that it's something that uh, we need to do further work on. Now, as I understand this, um, it's not saying that necessarily motorsports couldn't happen. It's just that they would be potentially controlled more because they would have to go through a planning process, or it could be that they get refused. Um, but that would be because there's demonstrable harm. And who would want to allow something to go on if there was demonstrable harm? So I, as a starter for 10, I just feel like I'm not convinced by the arguments that are being put forward here by the rejection. So um, Ben Boswell and then Councillor Jones. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Um, I think this goes back to what Richard Vaughan described really in, in the wording of it. it the recommendation is that that is made and I suppose that's rejected because we're not making that because further work is needed to go and do that to be able to um, implement it and I think the action does say there for planning office to, to liaise with legal to go and explore that so again it's going back to the very literal responses in this and and hopefully from the action there is the commitment there to go and, and explore this further so i suppose it this reminds me a little bit of cricket in the law of cricket and the spirit of cricket the spirit is that actually we're going to go and do it but by the letter of the law that's the response so um i don't know maybe a bad analogy but um i, I think that for me is very much how it sums it up just to come back on that, it does say that there, there will need to be a particularly strong justified reasons for withdrawing PD rights relating to a wide area. Um, is that the case? Uh, because if, if these activities are harmful, um, they're going to be harmful potentially to anywhere in the county where there's an issue. So uh, it's just push, pushing back on that uh, thought, really. Um, but Councillor Charles. Thanks. Um, I have an immense amount of sympathy with this um, issue, which uh, affects my ward as well. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Goodman from the legal department if he would like to contribute on this matter. My understanding is that we've had very clear advice from planning and legal that um, a blanket countywide Article 4 direction um, <clears throat> would be harder to justify than um, uh, one on a, on a case by case basis and uh, we are currently proceeding with um, efforts to move towards our first case related article four direction and um, Mr Goodman would you like to add anything on this? Uh, uh, thank you Councillor Charles no I have nothing to add on that I think um, that uh, we have an internal uh, expert in these matters and that is uh, what's what's set out in the response um, is uh, their legal advice. Um, I have no reason to gainsay that. That's not my particular area of expertise, um, but that is my understanding of the position. Because the, the, the query I have really is that it would, in having a, having those permitted development rights withdrawn, all the council's position is, is that it just can't be done automatically. It's that you have to apply for planning permission. So I think the issue is if it's site specific, it would seem pretty inconsistent that, well, you can do it at the south of the county, but you can't necessarily do it in the north of the county. And I think there would be some unfairness in that 
and then potentially push that type of development to an area of the county where that policy isn't in, a, in, in force. So I think the, the way I feel is that if it's perceived to be a problem and it's not necessarily in rural areas, um, then all we're looking for is general control countywide so that there's no inconsistency and then such activities are just controlled in a way that um, the planners at least and the committee system potentially has the opportunity to have a view and control it. I think if we do it piecemeal in specific areas, A, that would be greater workload and you know, take more time to achieve, and B, it wouldn't be consistent across the county and cause all kinds of anomalies as a result of that. So I, I'd just like to push back on that if I may. Councillor Chams. I'd fully support that perspective. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Hewitt. Um, well, I, I'd also like to say that, you know, in terms of um, protection for the environment, you can't have, you know, um, a, a, an administration which is trying to protect biodiversity and have motorsports screaming through areas where owls, bats, dormice, you know, whatever, are trying to establish their lives. And I mean, you know, in terms of public nuisance, in terms of noise as well, I just think, you know, you have to think, how does this serve our stated aim, which is protection of the environment? And um, it clearly doesn't. So we need to do something about it. OK, do we have any more comments on that? If not, so a, a recommendation, perhaps, that we reconsider the council's response and say, if you're gonna do an article four direction, it would be better off, the committee feels it would be better off to do a county-wide one rather than zone um, because of all the, the reasons we, we're in agreement of. And then if we've got to that stage in the meeting, we can now go on to any other recommendations that uh, we wish to discuss. And I know Councillor Bowes has been waiting very patiently to raise her Issue is it uh, recommendation 41? Yes, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, okay, over to you. Um, sorry. Um, so recommendation 41 was uh, around school travel planning. And I am beyond disappointed that uh, the target date is March, 2022. To me, that is completely unacceptable. That has got to be given a much higher priority. And my recommendation would be that we uh, put all resource or uh, work into getting that much sooner. I don't know if it's a resource issue or we need to get consultants in with the relevant expertise, but March 2022 is completely unacceptable. We should be sending out surveys now to parents, to school children. What are the barriers to stopping them using public transport, using walking, cycling, and at previous meetings, we said that we would make this a priority. Active travel measures are a priority. March 2022 is not a priority. So I recommend most strongly we up that the list to number one. Thank you. OK, looking at the, um, the list, it is owner Ben Boswell. Did you uh, wish to comment? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to find it. I didn't catch which recommendation number it was, so I've got it in front of me, but um, I will obviously answer your question. Sorry, I can't suppose. So I can't hear. Number 41. 41. Um, so it's about the, the, the deadline of March 2022 to get these plans in place. And uh, according to Councillor Bowes, that's not soon enough. OK, well, I guess... Um, it, it is important to say that there's an awful lot that's been happening for a number of years that we're looking to increase that activity and we've got a current bid in with the Department for Transport at present to do to do more with schools and we're hoping to hear back in the next few days so we've had a very comprehensive program in schools for the last probably seven years looking at, at travel plans um, supporting schools doing scooter skills um, learn to ride type activities um, and, and that's something that we, you know, we've got funding for for another year and we've got an application in at the moment for further funding to take that forward um, and, and to really review that countywide. So 
I think the action in there to do that by next year is to have reviewed them all. Um, I mean, I, I see that as a having completed the review by March. That's not to say that we haven't started it or done it. I mean, we've been supporting schools with their travel plans for years, and that's something that we go through. Part of the difficulty with the travel plan process, I guess, is is one thing to go and support a school to draft a travel plan, but ultimately any organisation that has a travel plan has to own that. So, you know, we, we would support them in, in doing it. And then as well as helping them to, to rewrite and redraft the travel plan, we've been offering support to schools and we're looking to do more there. But there's there's still that ownership of, of schools as well. So um, I, I see the, the target date there is when it would be completed, not when it started. It's already underway um, and has been for a number of years, really. Okay, Councillor Bowes, you want to come back on that? Yes, I'm on a mission with this. Sorry, Chair. Uh, I appreciate what you're saying, Ben, and I know people have been doing some hard work on it. And I'm not taking anything away from them. But over seven years, nothing has changed. So down the Belmont Road, every school day, there are hundreds of vehicles taking one child to school because they will not use public transport, they will not walk and they will not cycle. And we need to find out why they won't do this and what we can do about it. And as a priority, March 2022, not good enough. If we need to get in more resource, we need to get in more resource or consultants. We need to do it now, not wait another school year. It, it, it's just, I appreciate you've been doing all that work in the background, but nothing has changed. The Belmont Road, since I've lived down here, is full of cars taking people to school and that is affecting pollution. We need to do something now. So that needs to go up to number one. Thank you. Okay, would, would you be making a recommendation to um, ensure that, the, I mean, we, we, we acknowledge Even if we what... have to get extra resource chair, we have to get in consultants to do it. So my recommendation would be to get consultants or as much resource from wherever the, the cabinet member feels is appropriate to get that prioritised and moved up. Okay, so would it be something like um, as much resources necessary to improve the deadline of March 2022? Yeah, we need, it... we need to get the surveys out there and we need to get talking to people and um, moving things along, it is a priority. Okay, so um, yeah, so can, can I just, Councillor Hewitt, can I just go to Councillor Davis? She's got a hand up and she wanted to speak. Yeah, sorry, just um, it's not my cabinet portfolio, but what I would say is that these same discussions we're having at cabinet, it's not good enough to have to have, have these deadlines that are a year in advance. Um, and Ben, it's not your area as well. This is this is talking about the actual transportation side. Um, and that's the one that seems to have had the significant delays. I think most people will accept that you've done lots of really good work in the schools, but it's got to be driven by somebody saying to these schools, you have to, what what's the barriers? What are you going to do about it? And I would say that recommendation that you've just said isn't time limited. Um, I would say that you that I would be asking for a revision of that March 22 date because uh, I just think that it's not good enough. And if we do need to get consultants in to be able to do it, then we need to do it. It's it's the number one priority for certainly for residents on Belmont Road. Be okay. more, more than happy as cabinet. I'm sure Councillor Chang's would agree. That we'll be more than happy to take that back. Okay, um, Councillor Durkin, and then Councillor Hewitt, and then Councillor Chang's wants to come in. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mentioned earlier I have a, an overarching concern, and that has just been touched upon by uh, members here. Um, with regard to this excellent piece of work with 54 recommendations, etc., has any consideration been given to the capacity of the work, the officers within the Council, having the ability to fit all this additional work in without causing them any stress? And I hear that uh, consultants may be called in again. Um, I understand that, but my primary concern is regard to the workload of the officers. Uh, in particular, um, one of the recommendations, as you know, is for um, Mr. Bishop, Kevin Bishop, of planning to do something. Now, I know he is beyond um, with, with his workload. So my question is, has any piece of work been done to look to see uh, has the capacity for officers to deal with this effectively and efficiently been considered? Okay, well, there, there's an open question to um, anyone in the executive to uh, ponder on. Um, Councillor Chowns? 
I'm happy to take it as a general point, and also uh, I expect um, Ben Boswell will want to comment specifically. Um, we all know there is nowhere near enough money in local government to do all the things that we need to do. Um, we are under constant pressure, reducing amounts of money and increasing stuff that has to be done, and in particular, ever-growing social care needs. So all of us in Herefordshire are very familiar with the fact that money has progressively been taken away from areas in the kind of economy and place area um, and more and more funding is needed for children's and adults which is clearly a vitally important areas and um, I'd like to kind of you know pay massive tribute to the efforts of all of our officers who are working their socks off and um, trying really really hard to do more and more with less and less by working smart um, and there's been an immense amount of effort. It is true, Councillor Durkin, that as you say, you know, if if a task and finish group makes 58 recommendations, then that is more work for people. But everyone in the team is really committed to this area of work. That's one of the great things working, you know, everyone's really committed to doing as much as we possibly can. And it is just a question of having to make decisions about what is top priority. Councillor Bowes, totally hear your point about you know, the school run basically being the things that the thing that clogs up the streets in urban areas at particular times. And yeah, completely agree with you. We need to do more on that. In terms of funding, um, this administration has allocated 1.2 million to sustainable transport work in this financial year. I will take away from this meeting today, you know, an action to have a chat with a cabinet member for transport to say, look, can we make sure that school travel planning is really prioritised within that because it is it's a key kind of pinch point and you know the alternatives like you say active travel is so much better for everybody's health the people doing the active travel and the people who are kind of otherwise having to live with the pollution so totally take that point and um, could I just briefly mention I'm afraid I'm I'm talking people juggling I'm teaching at midday so I really need to leave at quarter two just to get my head into to prepare for that for, th for that work so uh, just need to, to mention that i hope that's okay chairman could i come back in there please yes absolutely councillor jacket thank you for that response councillor Chowns. um yes i'm aware everyone's aware that finances into local government is an issue but that wasn't my point i i think that's an accepted statement that um money is not enough i understand that especially for social care my concern is about the officer's workload, uh, especially as you, as you recognise, 54 recommendations does, it, does introduce workload into it. And my concern is, consultants apart, has any work been done to address how these recommendations are going to impact upon the well-being of these officers? Now, I didn't get a response to that from yourself in your initial answer, so I must assume the answer is no, but I would, if it is no, or a maybe, I would like to make a recommendation that this is made as a consideration, that we don't put officers under immense pressure trying to achieve a lot of a lot of work uh, in a such a short time. Appreciate most of it is, is important, all of it is important in its own right, but uh, it's about the well-being of the officers, Chairman. Okay, noted. I think that the general, well, Mr. Ball wants to come in. Sorry, Mr. Ball. Yeah, I wouldn't want to prolong the discussion too long, but uh, just just to just to uh, thank uh, Councillor Dirk and Councillor Chowns for the comments they've made regarding the officers' workload. Uh, the team work extremely hard, um, and um, that's you know that's, that's noted already. I suppose in terms of understanding the pressures on staff. Uh, this, this action plan will have been put together and uh, dates agreed with the owners. So if, we're to, if, if there are recommendations here today regarding uh, changing those dates and the, the time scale, you know, that potentially would have to be something that we'd need to review as to whether we have the capacity to take forward or indeed whether we needed to use uh, external support, such as consultants, as has been suggested. Uh, but um, I, I suppose I can assure you that the, the deadline is set in the in the response are those set by the owners themselves bearing in mind uh, the resources that they have available to them at this present time could, well, chairman could, could, could i make that a, a, a recommendation that, that some work is done with regard to 
establishing that the capacity is there. If it's not going to be there, how are we going to address it? Okay, then. Well, I think we, we've got... Um, sorry, Ben Boswell wanted to come in and now Richard Vaughan does. But I think the general point is going to be, whilst we've got um, recommendations such as Councillor Bowes to try and expedite matters much more, if there are issues, resourcing issues or issues of workload, I think what the executive is going to have to do is make sure that those points are clarified in any of their responses to any of the recommendations we put forward. And, I, I, you know, we, we note the point that um, committee members are thinking that March 2022 is not soon enough. But if there is some explanation as to any of these timelines in, in the terms of resource, then it'll be for members of the committee to take that on board. Right. OK. So, Mr. Boswell, did you want to come in with your point or is the point uh, been made? Richard, Richard's already covered what I yeah, was going OK. To and then, Mr. Vaughan, did you want to make your point? Thank you. Yes. Um, it was only to point uh, the group towards recommendation four, which is the executive should ensure all relevant teams are sufficiently resourced um, under that. Um, and as Richard Bull did say, um, all relevant heads of services have been consulted during the process and all teams are adequately resourced to carry out the work um, under these responses. Um, so that, as Richard says, if, if any of the timeframes change, then obviously we'll need to go back to the action owners uh, to confirm that those action owners were consulted under all of these responses um, and have put forward these timeframes themselves. Thank you, Chairman. If I could just respond to that, if I may. Yeah. Fine, it's great um, that all the owners have been consulted, and that's brilliant. But where we have an issue, uh, Councillor Bowes' buses or the transport pensions going to get uh, need to get consultants in. This is something that needs to be highlighted so that we are all aware that that, that they are being people are being safeguarded. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, noted. Right, um, before we move on, um, Councillor Charles, thank you for your contributions. If you need to go, please do so. But thank you for listening and for, for, for feeding back. Obviously, the committee is very passionate about uh, the work of the task and finish groups. And um, thank you for helping us walk through what was rejected and what wasn't necessarily rejected, but has been rethought. And um, we look forward to being able to send you the uh, new recommendations and hope you will uh, take them on board and read them with interest. Thank you. Right, any further questions for Councillor Chance before she has to leave? No, if not, thank you very much. And thank you, um, thank you. have a good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. And, and just to say, as, as the members of the Task and Finish Group um, know, um, I'm trying to set up an informal meeting to discuss with them, you know, moving forward on, on some of this stuff, pending whatever governance arrangements we do um, come to, to collectively drive forward on this agenda as fast as we all can together. So thanks everybody for all of your interest and effort. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Right, have we got any more points that we wish to raise um, with regards to the, the recommendations before us? on the task and finish group. Councillor Hewitt. So recommendation 20 was accepted, um, a greater focus on NDPs. And interestingly, this one was sort of accepted, even though it basically it's saying it's something that we're, we're already doing, you know, giving advice on the climate and ecological emergency. So I would have expected this one to be rejected given what the format was before, because we're already doing it. However, this one says accepted. But what I'm concerned with is that you can accept something, but you know what, what I'm interested in is how are you going to ensure, so in NDPs, if they're already advising on the climate and ecological emergency, what sort of monitoring is there going on of you know, what those um, NDPs, those neighbourhood development plans have been able to achieve in those categories. So, you know, in, in all the criteria for the CEE, is, are the, are the um, parish councils or being able to feed back to Sandbank saying, under your criteria, we have been able to do this, this, this and this. And then we get a clear picture of actually whether those advisories were actually being paid any attention to at all or whether they were making a difference. So my, I would like there to be a feedback mechanism 
by which um, the neighborhood development, um, I don't know what Sam Banks' is title is, she's not NDP officer, she says, um, is that what she is? Is that what the title is? Anyway, so that she knows how, what a difference their advisory notes are making, because at the moment, we've got no idea whether they're making any difference at all. Mr Vaughan, did you want to come back on, on, on that? Yep, thank you, Councillor Lester, and thanks, Councillor Hewitt, again, for providing that in advance. That was very helpful. Um, so just to clarify, that's been accepted because what Sam is saying in her response is actually three of these will be expanded. Uh, so guidance note 23, 24 and 25 will be reviewed, recast and broadened to cover a greater focus on low carbon policies, carbon reduction, transport, green space and biodiversity. So that, that has been accepted because that will be done. It isn't business as usual. That, those will be reviewed, recast and broadened um, as per the request, Councillor Hewitt. Um, in terms of uh, your question on monitoring, um, I do have a written response from Sam Banks. Um, so your question was um, guidance notes are already in place. Can we talk to her please about how uh, we plan to monitor whether these guidance notes are making a difference? Uh, Sam's response was that the team have produced a set of 36 guidance notes on which a wide range of subjects to assist parish councils developing policies within their neighborhood development plans. Uh, the content of the guidance notes is regularly reviewed to determine whether they're up to date with national planning policy fit for purpose and covering all the issues uh, parish councils have requested information upon. Additional guidance notes can be added and existing ones expanded, recast and updated as required. We ask parish councils to highlight if there are any issues not covered within the guidance notes or any areas that require expansion. Should be noted that Hereford Council guidance notes have been commended by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government and the Planning Advisory Service and many other local planning authorities refer their parishes to our guidance notes. There are very few local planning authorities who offer such a wide range um, ready available to support their parish councils. Uh, the policy of the neighbourhood development plans are monitored to ensure they are meeting the requirements of the core strategy and national policy and the parish councils are requested to also monitor the effectiveness of their policies within the neighbourhood development plans. It is this monitoring which governs the effectiveness of the resulting policies rather than monitoring of guidance notes itself, which helps to determine what advice needs updating. I'm not sure that I get where the feedback from, um, from uh, parish councils is on that. It was, that. Was there any in there? Because I think that that is where, you know, you know, if they made a list, you know, every six months to say, you know, we have been able to, in our area, affect it, just tick them, you know, on a month by month basis, which ones they've been able to actually incorporate and tick. That would give us a really um, wonderful plaudit for the council. I mean, I, I'm really pleased that we've been commended on our list, but a list is only as good as, you know, I can get on holiday and discover that I've forgotten my pants, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just... You know, a list is only as good as what you can actually remember to effect, so, or manage to effect. Okay, any, any further comments or a recommendation as a result of that? It is noted. No, if I've got one question um, on recommendation 32. Um, can somebody just explain to me, because I, not aware phosphate trading platform what, what does that mean does anybody know mr boswell ben boswell thank you so um this is this is part of the work i mentioned earlier really on on the council taking a real lead issue on reducing phosphates so we we've um commissioned ricardos who are national experts in, in this and and We've got a three-part piece of work really. There's, uh, it's what we're calling the interim development plan. Stage one is developing a, a phosphate calculator so that developers can understand what the phosphate load of any potential development is to help them understand the implications. The second part of that is looking at a suite of mitigation measures, helping them to understand what they can then do on site to help offset that load within their own development to make it to make it uh, phosphate neutral. So that that then works on the calculator to help them as they're 
And then the third part of it is around developing a trading a phosphate trading platform so that should a development not be able to uh, achieve neutrality within its own on-site mitigation, then to be able to to buy phosphate credits from other projects in, in the county that are having a net reduction in phosphate levels so that we can demonstrate neutrality across across that development then and in the in the uh, river river log sack. So the first two pieces of work uh, are complete and have recently been put on the website. So the phosphate calculator and mitigation measures are on our web as of last week with an update position statement for that. The, the last bit is that bit that's still going on. So we're now working with, with legal and with uh, planning colleagues around how that platform would work. And again, that ties in very closely with the work we're doing, developing the integrated constructed wetlands, which would be projects where we're looking to, well, where we're progressing to, buy and build wetlands in in the river Y, uh, sorry, the river lug catchment area so that we can have a net reduction in phosphates and then that would generate again credits that would then enable that development to happen so that's probably a bit uh, sure, full yeah. answer uh, yeah no 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 that that's that 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 answers um a full answer and it explains to me exactly what i thought it meant and my challenge back is that if phosphates can be so damaging we shouldn't be trading in them because if they have direct negative consequences to the environment, um, especially the water courses, then we, we don't want to be encouraging development that causes adds to the problem, no matter how better it is elsewhere. So I, I, I just, there just seems to me to be something intuitively wrong about trading in, in, in what ends up being a pollutant. Um, and having negative consequences for the environment where it's happening rather than it being better the north of the county or the south of the county or, or, or wherever. So I just find that to be quite a challenge to accept that that's an acceptable policy. And Councillor Hewitt, you're nodding and wanting to come in. Well, I, I would agree because, you know, on that scenario, you could potentially, you know, hypothetically have a big housing estate or, um, I don't know, an anaerobic digester or, a, or a, a, an IPU that was going to cause immense damage for a little bit on a certain stretch of the river. But if we're looking at overall quality over the whole river, then, you know, I, in, in my opinion, you know, causing a bit of damage somewhere or a large amount of damage somewhere and offsetting it somewhere else is not the game that we should be in, especially where biodiversity is concerned. Is that is that essentially what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I just think if, if, if it has the potential to cause a bit of pollution somewhere, the fact that it's not causing pollution elsewhere, it, it doesn't. It seems to me to be a local problem that's being added to. Even though there's a net reduction, it still doesn't stop the immediate problem at, at the location. But um, Mr. Boswell, you wanted to come back on that point. Yeah, I was just gonna just to reinforce really the entire work here is all about improving river river quality, river health, and it's about improving the entire health of the entire catchment area. Um, and so. You know, through the HRA, it is very much got a minimum got to deliver neutrality. It does have to, you know, we, we're looking here at betterment. That is exactly what we're looking at. So the, this isn't a solution to enable more pollutants in the river. It's quite the opposite. It's about reducing phosphate levels in the river. Um, what this also does uh, by doing this would be create, a, it could potentially create a marketplace where other people want to start doing lots more phosphate reduction projects to generate credits, which would then have a further betterment to the river. So it, it's around tackling a number of issues. So it's going to create, well, yeah, it's creating the, it's unlocking the development in the, in the county in what should already be. And the hierarchy is the, you've got to deliver the uh, neutrality on site. If you can't, then this is us exploring how we can deliver that through still delivering betterment in the entire catchment. So it, I, I, I take your, your reservation on it, but it is not at the cost of the river and not at the cost of the environment. This is entirely about betterment. Yes, the first two measures, I would agree, seem to sound like they're about betterment. The third bit about trading, though, just doesn't seem to me to be a betterment. I, I take the point about it being neutral overall, but I still come back to the point I made about, and I think Councillor Hewitt is with me on this one, if, if there's a development that has a higher concentration and is not a betterment, 
you're still left with a pollution problem potentially, no matter how better it is elsewhere. I think what would be helpful, Ben, is is to let to see a specific example of what you're talking about, because you know it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Lots of all the other measures that you've been talking about make sense, but this bit has never made sense to me. And you know, I can't see. I can't see how it's going to, it's like saying, oh, we'll, we'll allow ourselves to open one coal power station somewhere, but we're going to plant some trees or, you know, which is a little bit more of what we've been doing all the way along, really. So I'm, I'm confused. So do you mind just jump, jump back in one yes, really quickly? Yes, of course. So I suppose one thing I didn't mention is that as part of a training platform, you would ensure that you're looking at, um, if say, say you had a project that created 100 credits, you wouldn't say that all 100 credits would be then sold through a, a trading system. You, know, you would retain some of the credits to ensure the, the overall benefit as well as the rest of it. So it, at the very least, it, it's better. I mean, I mean, these trading platforms do exist and operate across the country, not necessarily on phosphates, but things like nitrates in other areas of the county that it works very well. It, it helps to improve the natural environment, but also, also enabling the economic development in, in those areas as well. And it's about doing both together. So you've got that you know, environmental and economic benefit. Um, in terms of a specific example in Herefordshire, I mean, we are still working up this phosphate calculator. It's work in progress, so we'd, I can't give you an example of one that's happened because we haven't got there yet. This is work that's that's underway. Um, you know, this all of this work is going to have to be compliant with the Habitat, uh, the HRA. So, it, it, you know, we're working very closely with Natural England, working with them on their leading and emerging new policies on on phosphates, and you know, we're all, as I said, we're all coming from this at this with a river improvements perspective that that is the driver here so um i don't think i'd be able to necessarily allay your concerns of the principle but as it f progresses further i could probably take you through it in more detail yeah okay i mean i'm i'm prepared to draw a line under it at this stage just you just chalk me up as being a bit of a skeptic where it comes to phosphate trading and uh more detail will obviously be be helpful in my understanding and others understanding of whether it's uh something we could support or not. Right. Can I have a recommendation here, Jonathan, that, um, that the um, officers make a, um, like a public statement, a clear public statement about how um, trading platforms work and that it goes on the sort of climate and ecological emergency, you know, website, so that it's there for everybody to think about and consider. And some really good examples of where it has worked and what it does. Uh, I, I'd be supportive of that recommendation and then more information will then obviously enable members of the public to draw their views on, on the matter. Right, okay, so we've, I think we've pretty much gone through all of the um, recommendations for the task and finish group on the climate emergency. So unless there's any others, uh, I propose that uh, we need to... Uh, sorry, Councillor Hewitt. I'm really sorry. There's just one last thing, which I um, outlined in red. It's recommendation 22, and it's, um, it's about the uh, flood uh, SFRA. I can't remember what the acronym stands for now. Sorry, I have to go back to my page. You hang on two minutes. It's about... Um, it's they're working on SFRA 2009 and so that's already 12 years out of date when do we get a new flood water management act a new baseline um for this you know I'm I'm very sorry I'm jabbling away because actually I have to be a bit clearer so if you just hold on two seconds yeah absolutely I was going meanwhile I was going to propose a 10 minute break if that's what if that's is everybody in agreement with that? It's just a 10 minute yeah. break before we then talk about the waste management review. Um, conscious of the time, but I think uh, after two I'll hours- script, everybody... I'll just send something to um, to you on this, Jonathan, and see what you okay. think. Okay. Right, okay. But um, I make it um, 12 o'clock. So if it's possible, just have a 10 minute break and then we can go back to yeah. the meeting. So if we can pause the- 
Um, so, sorry, Chairman, I was actually going to say, in, in the light of Councillor Davies' his comments, do you want to go straight um, to her, perhaps? Yeah. Okay, right. We resumed the meeting of the general scrutiny meeting, and we've just had a 10 minute recess break. And we will, uh, we've just been discussing the recommendations and the responses from the executive to the climate emergency task and finish group. And we're now going on to the part of the meeting where we will discuss the task and finish groups uh, work on um, the waste management and the contracts. And just would like to take this opportunity because uh, some of the councillors who served on those task and finish groups aren't actually here, but I would just like to, uh, at this point, thank them once again. I've thanked them in the past, but thank them once again for all of that work that they did. Um, and this included officers like uh, Kenton and Nicola Percival. So thank you for all of that work. It was a, a lot of work over a long period of time. So appreciate all of those efforts. But that's, that's why we're here as a committee to make sure that all of that hard work is being followed up. And um, we've had a good general discussion about um, the first task and finish group, but, but now we will move seamlessly on to the findings of the and recommendations of the task and finish group with regard to waste. And we have the recommendations before us. Do officers want to make any comments before councillors wade in with their recommendations and comments? Ben Boswell. Yeah, Over to you. Thank you. Um, and again, I don't know if Nicola wants to potentially say anything as well, but um, I mean, again, just to, to echo your, your comments, really, I mean, there was an awful lot of work done on this task and finish group uh, on, on the review, um, and there's been an awful lot of work done since. So what, what was attached, I believe, to the papers was the formal executive response, which was, um, I think it was published on, uh, or formally approved on the, is it 20 seconds, which was last last week. Um, within the paper there are, are 23 recommendations of which 21 were approved in full and two were approved in part um, and there's been quite a, a number of work streams since the task and finish group. Um, so when the first, so after the, the task and finish group concluded uh, there was a cabinet member report on the 26th of October that noted the task and finish group and the recommendations and formally approved to proceed with the uh, consultation as recommended by the by the scrutiny group um, and so I'm sure you'll all be very aware of, of that one and that was undertaken between December and February we did two all member briefings on on that one and the results of the consultation are now live on the website um, further to that we did a separate report um, looking at the review and the resourcing needed to undertake that again which was another recommendation of the group so there was a fifth of uh, 5th of February reports that allocated, I believe it was about 820,000 from the dedicated waste reserve to, to fund both the new temporary team and um, the any required technical support as part of or commissioning report uh, support as part of the review. Um, and so really, I, I suppose the report was extremely helpful in helping to take that forward and the responses I wasn't proposing to go through them all in detail like the other one because I think, you know, as I say, 21 were approved and two were approved in part. So um, I don't know if it's best maybe for me to pass over to either Nicola if she wanted to add or to Councillor Davis. Well, if we, I think if we hear from uh, Councillor Davis first and then if we go to Nicola Percival if she wants to make any specific points. So just to echo the thanks um, to the task and finish group and also to the scrutiny committee for their continued interest in the matter, um, which is probably one of our biggest opportunities um, in waste that I can ever remember. So I'm just happy to go in with questions. OK, and Nicola Percival, did you want to make any comments? I think Ben's covered it all, really. I mean, I mean, just in, in term, terms of background. Sorry, I've got dog barking. Um, Obviously, it's come about because our co main contracts are, are coming to an end. Um, we had new government um, guidance with regards to a strategy for England um, and the circular economy. And I think that the, the task and um, finish group 
put quite a lot in there um, to really help uh, focus and drive us forwards over the next um, over the next few years. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, and thank you for waiting so patiently in the in the in the wings um, as well. So uh, it's noted. Um, right over to committee members. Comments on the recommendations, Councillor Hewitt. Um, yeah, well, well, sort of a general comment about this is that quite a lot of it's waiting until we have news from national government. And so that makes life a bit difficult. And we had a general discussion at the beginning about how um, collection and disposal. And we there was a discussion about this, but I didn't comment at the time. Nicola will remember that we talked a lot in the group about how the one affected the other and when we weren't at all unaware of the fact that whatever decisions we make on collection need to reflect um, flexibility in relation to disposal and what we want there. So, you know, there, and I'm sure that that's one of Nicola's top priorities, but I want to go to um, the zero waste to landfill um, policy recommendation four, because I think a dis it would be helpful, Nicola, in this, in this group here, if you describe what the difficulties are around contractual arrangements with that, because you know when you're wanting zero waste landfill, there's sort of stages where it gets more and more residual, so you've got less and less and less, and at I don't know two percent or one percent, suddenly a contractor said, "Well, it's not worth more while doing it." Then is it? So you have to. So there's a, a sort of contractual impediment to actually affecting progress in that area. And I think it would be helpful if you could discuss that with the members of the group here. I mean, in, in terms of our current con contractual arrangements, the contractor um, doesn't have an obligation um, to use our energy from waste facilities. So um, other than recovering um, a certain quantity of waste, they can currently choose to use the energy from waste facility or landfill to dispose of our waste. Um, moving forwards, um, we'll never get zero waste to landfill because there are certain aspects of waste um, which can't be dealt with in any other way. Um, but it is something that we could specify within um, a contract moving forwards that we are um, looking for um, the use of the energy from waste facility um, to be utilised, um, you know, for the, the the vast majority of our waste um, or all of that which cannot be treated, you know, or, or which must only be treated through landfill in future. Does that help? I think I I'm, I think I sort of must have misunderstood that part of our discussions because what you're actually saying is that the um, the contract that exists at the moment um, allows the the contractor to decide whether they're going to put it in landfill or whether they're going to take it to the energy from waste. Yeah. So so yeah, I think this makes it clearer to me. So. So basically, the uh, the power in the situation to create zero waste landfill at the present resides with the contractor that you've employed. Is that right? Yes, and being bear, yes. bear in mind, you know, this is a twenty five year PFI contract, and at the point where you know this contract was established, yeah. um, energy from waste wasn't on the cards. There was alternative yeah. treatments that were going to be looked at, and landfill was still very much. Um, the the main the way the main disposal option um i mean I, I guess that's where some of the inflexibility comes from in that it was a 25 year contract it was very very long um and and therefore that the the fourth or um may not have gone quite that far um but but yeah they they're not obligated to send all of our waste to our energy from waste facility currently. And, and their contract lasts and, uh, similarly until 2024, is that right? Um, it's due to end 2024. There is an option for extension beyond that for a further five years. Yeah. Okay, 
right? That, that clarifies things for me a bit. So we can change it to say the priority is, you know, a minimum to landfill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now's the time to uh, become ambitious with that and control the contract so that it's achieving a greater use of the, the facility. Right, we've got Councillor Stark and then Councillor Davis. But Councillor Davis, did you want to come in and comment on this specific point? So can we, if it's okay with you, Councillor Stark, if we go to Councillor Davis first? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Lester. Yeah, <clears throat> um, coming back on Councillor Hewitt's issue, I absolutely get what you're saying on that. And I was flummoxed that that, that was actually the case. I don't think that it's in the public domain enough that, yeah, um, that yeah. the waste, what happens to individuals' waste on its journey. And I think that that's something that we desperately need to do with the new resource that's coming into the team is to show us life cycle of waste and where it goes. And I think that that needs to be for all ages so that everybody understands. And that's for me, a clear message that we have to get across. When you have your, pick up your green waste bags from your library, where does that go? And we need to be able to have that journey for people to understand what impacts when they think they're doing something well, that actually it could mean that it's ending up in the place that they never imagined it would be. So I think that's really clear. Um, <coughs> that specific point around a contract, about the disposal contract, is a red line for me. Yeah. Um, and I've made it very clear talking with contractors and with, uh, with Worcestershire Council that for me that is a red line that you, yeah. we cannot have it that we're sending any waste to landfill. It makes it makes no sense. It goes completely against our ethos in Herefordshire. Um, so just to give you that assurance that that's, that's where we're at. And the second point, which is the first one that you actually raised was around about the disposal and the collection being disjointed. I think you're absolutely right. And that's one of the reasons why the report was pulled. Um, so you will have seen that the report was due to come to cabinet last week. And for me, it didn't make those risk evaluations and the impact on the disposal contract that going with the specific collection model would have had. And it's that that's going to be improved for the next report, which will be coming back next month. So just to let you know that disjointedness is felt and we're doing something to pick that up. Yeah. On that particular point, Councillor Davis, um, <clears throat> we're talking about landfill and, and, and where what happens to the waste. I think what would also be very important also, and it's something that we perhaps didn't pick up on when this came to scrutiny the last time, is we can tick a box and say it's being recycled, but I think greater awareness of what that actually means and where it goes, I think is equally important because if it's a bottle, plastic bottle that's being turned into a fleece in Britain, and that's great. That really is a good example of recycling. But if recycling means it goes to another country and we're not entirely sure what happens to it, but they're claiming it's being recycled and whatnot, my fear is if we don't know specifically, we may increase our rates of recycling, but only by ticking a box. And, and that's one of my concerns, I think, that I have. I absolutely share that concern. It's yeah. and it's the further along the journey of that waste where it becomes very blurred with where we're able to check that people are taking the right actions and that we're not ending up. I mean, we've all seen the seen the documentaries where you end up with the packets being um, we're all sending them for recycling and they end up in the Indian Sea. So it, there's lots of things that I think. We're, I'm grateful that there's so much awareness now, but I think we need to make it Herefordshire centric so that we explain where our waste goes and what happens further down that journey. And that circular economy, um, I mean, if you've seen the Soil in the City project on Stronger Towns, that's a perfect example. Let's get some waste from food waste from within Herefordshire, turn it into compost that we then use across the county and you create that circular economy of waste and also enrich the soils that we've got. So I think it's, it's examples like that that we need to be really shouting about. Um, Councillor Stark has been waiting patiently. Um, yes, Chair, I think Councillor Davis has touched upon my sort of thought in part, but not fully enough. And my point refers to recommendation 15. I'll just let everyone perhaps go, go to the recommendation itself. Where this does touch upon 
um, how we design the collection system in the context of how the waste is dis disposed of. Um, Councillor Davis, I don't think this is ambitious enough, to be honest. This isn't about disjointedness. To me, it's about designing a waste management strategy that provides an end-to-end -end waste service to the residents in Herefordshire. That's not just about coming up with a model for collection. That's c coming up with a unified model that provides a continuum from repair and reuse right through to collection and disposal where everything happens in a unified manner. Now, I know that the government is concentrating on collection and has given us some national <clears throat> guidelines as to what we need to do in terms of changing the way we collect the materials we uh, dispose of. But I really do think this is an ideal opportunity to look at and to design a waste management unified system that takes us right through the whole journey of the waste and where every part of it is then actually being treated as a whole in terms of that journey. And I would ask you to do that rather than just to look at the disjointedness of the, of the two. Apologies if it came across that that wasn't what I was intended to do. The exact thing that you've just said is what we're doing um, and also trying to be innovative. I see it as a really good opportunity. Lots of people see it as a negative that we're one of the first councils that have got the opportunity to look at the new regulations. I see it as an incredible opportunity where we can think big. We can go right. All those things that we weren't sure about before. Let's 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 go big with it because ultimately the decision that we make now we're going to be stuck with for a long long time and people joke with me well I think they just think I'm an idiot um when I say I'd love to build um a big wall around Herefordshire and if we could keep all of our waste in that particular area then that's when we've got it right um and there are some innovative ideas that are coming through on what we could do and it even goes down th to things councillor with how do we sort? Because the worst case scenario for us is that we have new collection approaches. We do it really good here and then it goes to Worcestershire and it all gets jumbled up again together and all of that hard work was for nothing. And that's where I think that overarching strategy has to come in. So yeah, absolutely happy to take that as a recommendation that we, mm. that, that we accept. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that, Chair, I would like that as a recommendation, because I think it will give power to Councillor Davis's elbow. Okay. Um, can I just make a point about recommendation 13? It's about options two and three. <clears throat> we, we, we had a discussion at the last committee meeting where we discussed this and it was, you know, recommended to take forward options two and three. And the results of that, um, the uh, consultation was going to cabinet uh, last week, um, but it, it's been delayed. And so that will be forthcoming. But whilst I read the cabinet report, uh, despite Council Councillor Hitchener's email saying it was uh, going to be delayed. Um, thank you for that, Councillor Hitchener. Um, I did reread the, uh, well, I read the committee report um, that will no doubt be coming to uh, Cabinet in due course. But it got me thinking about the issues again. And uh, as I recall, the option two, uh, which I think is the one that, well, I don't want to, uh, no spoilers, but option two um, is about the, the recycling uh, alternate weeks and then the third week being the black bin uh, option. My thinking or my my concern about that option is that three weeks is probably too long for that type of waste to be sat there in people's bins. And so my thinking would be, in order to avoid that, why wouldn't we have a system where option two is that the black bin gets collected every two weeks, as it does now, but the recycling option alternates so therefore you've got three different types of big bin being collected but you haven't got the black bin being sat there for three weeks um, so that's just uh, an idea that i wondered what officers would think about that and i can see 
Nicola Percival's quick off the uh, uptake and wants to answer that question. Yeah, uh, the, the reason it's in there as a three weekly collection is that um, the intention under that twin stream recycling service would be that your cans, plastics, um, glass were collected on one week, your paper and cardboard were collected on another week and your residual is collected on the third week. That means that one fleet of the same type of vehicle can be used for all of those three different streams, which makes the service cheaper. If you want the black bin emptying once every two weeks, um, you'd need additional vehicles, additional fleet, additional crews to be able to deliver that, which obviously comes at an additional cost. Um, so it's the configuration of the, um, the collection fleet, um, which um, uh, informs the, the three weekly cycle there of the three different types of, of material and keeps that service particularly, um, it came out as the, the cheapest service. Um, I mean, it, with regards to your concern about what's going to be in those bins over that three weekly, um, the intention obviously is that the collection service would be collecting food waste on a weekly basis separated. Um, and by all intents and purposes, there would be a fair amount of people's bins. Well, our audit has shown it's a fair amount of people's bins, which is food waste, which is the particularly stinky stuff um, that we're proposing to put in a collection service for. Yes, um, I, I don't really particularly want this meeting to be about my waste habits, but um, I'm, I'm someone who composts, gets rid of my food waste by composting, um, and do my recycling and my recycling of garden waste, but I still end up with a full bin after two weeks. So my, my concern is that, you know, I've got a, a garden of a normal size, but there's plenty of room to, for me to store my waste, but there will be other households that aren't necessarily having as much space out the front where their bin is or space out the back where their bin's stored. And so I just think that there is a concern that trying to store that type of waste in a three week cycle may cause households some problems. I knew there had to be a logistical reason for the proposal and obviously cost and, and the fleet is an issue, but I still think that there is potentially a problem with not having that residual waste collected in a two week cycle as it is now. Councillor Hewitt. Nicola, can you remind me, did we have a talk about uh, nappies? You know, because they generally get put in a black bin. And, you know, if you've got three toddlers who are all producing nappies, that is an issue. Um, I mean, I know that in some urban areas they have dedicated um, nappy waste collection that you can sign on to. But I, I do think that that will be an issue for young families. I, I mean, I personally don't, I, I sort of struggle to fill my black bin over a two week basis because it's generally just wrappers and things, but um, you know, wrappers that won't uh, decompose, but nappies are an issue. And I wondered whether you could, you could advise us about that. Yeah, um, I mean, in for a lot of people, um, it's the volume there of the nappies that, that's the problem. If we are taking more stuff out of their bin and they're using their bin fully, there will be increased space in their bin. Um, I take the point that a, th a three weekly collection with nappies in it um, might not be particularly nice during the summer, um, but if they are stored correctly, um, wrapped, appropriately um, you know there are authorities that do a three weekly collection um, we did talk about the possibility of looking into um, maybe a separate collection for that for that type of, of waste um, I think that that isn't isn't included within the report at the moment and it wasn't something that people generally raise as a concern through the consultation either um, food waste was um, the smell of food waste was um, nappies I don't I don't think I recall any comments particularly um, 
but then the families who who or the people who chose the other collection service which had the fortnightly collection um, did tend to be larger families um, I mean Councillor Lester with regards on the other issue of that with regards to the type of property and that sort of thing um, for example blocks of flats we're not suggesting that we move their collection service to a three weekly basis simply because having gone through the process in 2014 with the alternate weekly collection we are very aware that there is there's just not enough room on those sites to be able to put additional bins and those sorts of things so as part of the service design we will be considering um you know blocks of flats um and and different properties where where space is going to be a particular problem how we configure that collection service um so that all of the segregated waste can still be collected but it will probably for those properties need to be on a different frequency to what the standard service would be across the county so that will be worked into the service design okay well thank you for that clarification uh, councillor davis and then mr boswell <coughs> sorry yeah thank you for that and yeah i'm really glad that nicola gave that that explanation i think going back to councillor stark's point if we build a service around our current waste and how we dispose of waste then we're on a hide into nothing so for me it's about how do we build a waste strategy based upon the principle that very little waste enters into the stream so for example with the nappies how do we engage with mothers around using the old style muslin that you used to get? Um, well, I know my mum definitely used them rather than the disposable nappies. Um, so how do we how do we engage with the public to look at doing things in a different way that prevents that waste going into our, into our stream? So I think that that's that's the wider project, and I'm really grateful that we've got a member we, we're recruiting for member staff to change that culture and also to find out why people don't want to go down that route as well um because i've seen some horrific evidence of nappies being left um had one left at the top of my walkway the other day which was lovely um so there's lots of ideas and i really do appreciate people that live in flats i live in a flat and the thought of having some of the things left in your waste bin for, for three weeks is absolutely not OK. And I've made assurances to somebody last week at Cabinet that every single person will be taken into consideration. And if you need to have it collected more, then that's something we have to build into that strategy. But I would say the overarching thing is let's look at how we can dispose of waste in a different way and build the service around that. OK, thank you. And uh, Ben Boswell, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you. I think some of what I was going to say has already kind of been said both by Nicola and Councillor Davis, really. But I just wanted to, to also add that in, in all of the, the options going forward, there is actually more capacity, more volume for waste for all um, residents anyway. Because if you're introducing an extra bin, there's quite a lot more volume in which all the waste you do produce can go into. Um, and I suppose just noting as well that the, the other considerations are about how we're minimising the carbon impact of each of the services uh, just echoing the sort of conversation we had earlier really and then also how we achieve the highest recycling rates and again you know that's why the, those those options would were, were put forward really it's their their opportunity to both reduce carbon re increase recycling rates and, and as Councillor Davis really importantly put really it's around the education of people to help them to recycle more uh, to reuse more and to to avoid the waste in the first place as well. So we're going to be doing an awful lot around all of that together. Okay, th thank you. Um, the I, I don't see any hands up. Um, while we're on about recycling uh, of waste options, the recommendation 22, we can just go to that one. I just wanted to raise this before Councillor Davis has to rush off. It's the ability to reuse um, waste that's brought to the household recycling centres. I've christened it my trash and treasure scheme. And the way it's written, when, was this, when it was discussed about 
making sure that items taken to the local tips can be reused rather than just thrown into the skip. I understood it that it was for members of the public to perhaps help themselves to items. It says here that it's going to be offered to charities, but some of the charities aren't accepting it. I would have thought that a really successful opportunity would be this idea of, as I say, trash, you know, somebody's trash is another person's treasure and have the opportunity for members of the public, if they're at the tip and see that old bike there thinking, well, I could take that and get that repaired. And so can I just put it in the back of my car and then I'll repair it and that gets reused. That to me seems to be recycling at its most grassroots form. And as I understood the concept, it wasn't for that item to be squirreled away and then offered to people at a later date. I think it would have been a good idea to just offer it to members of the pub. If you want that bike and put an extra wheel on it or something, take it home with you, you know. So that's how I envisage that, but it doesn't seem to be that that's how it's manifesting itself. So could, could I have some feedback on, on that point, please? Have I misunderstood something? No, I, I think that is how it reads. I, I, I do think that's how, I think your, your perception's right on that. Um, I'm like a bin lady when I go to the recycling centres and you see the things people are throwing out like a slide for a child the other day. And I thought somebody could really use that. Um, so actually we've moved on quite a bit since, since this report was written. So right. we are engaging at the moment with community organisations to try and firstly find out whether there's space for them on our sites, but secondly, whether or not there are sites that we could be offering within our asset portfolio for things like that to go there for members of the public to, to look through and to help themselves to. Because if you think of some of our sites, they're very constrained with the, the space that they've got. But for example, using Ross on Y, the site's not particularly big, but you've got environability just around the corner that could be entering into negotiations with us or, or an agreement with us that they could have some form of, I don't know, like a shipping container, small shipping container or something like that on site um, that volunteers would love to run and they're able to say to people come and have a look at this yeah if you want to take that one away i think you're absolutely right i think it didn't gauge it in the response here but it is now it's now got legs and we're taking that forward so i i yeah you're right okay th th thanks for that that sounds really encouraging um obviously sites are constrained and you can't have everybody shopping whilst people are trying to drive past in the queue to get out um but uh, yes if that can be extended to members of the public I think that would be a, a really good successful way because we've all done it. We've all gone to the tip and seen that bentwood chair in the skip and thought, oh, I could have had that. Right. OK, Councillor Bowes. Thank you. I've just got a couple of uh, questions for Councillor Davis, is that, if that's OK. Uh, one of them was around recommendation six, recruitment of the new waste uh, communications officer. So I just wanted an update on progress on that and the other one is recommendation 10 uh, commercial services offered to holiday lets and landlords of domestic properties I just wondered how we're communicating that I'm going to pass that one over to officers because I know it's a live recruitment at the moment so Ben or Nicola will you be able to answer those ones thank you yeah so the where um the Press and Publicity Officer post um, application date has closed, so we're progressing with um, shortlisting and then interviews for that. The other officer post, just to update you on those three, um, there's um, two waste transformation officers and a waste transformation manager post that are currently out to advert. I think the, the closing date for those is the 6th of May, um, so those will also be um, uh, progress the progressing at the moment um the sorry remind me the next the next question it was just around the commercial services for holiday lets and landlords of domestic properties how we're communicating to them that there's a bulky collection service that that they could use um, so at the moment, I mean, that's that's brand new that we've we've just introduced from the, the 1st of April um, and we're, we are still trying to um, determine with our customer services team how we identify those. Um, we've we've got um, a list of what we know to be um, 
uh, holiday lets through business rating. Um, so they they will will be informed um, in due course. Um, some of the introduction of this is that at the moment they're using the service anyway, but as a normal domestic property and under the legislation as a normal domestic property they only pay the collection charge what we've introduced is that actually they'll pay the whole charge moving forwards um, so we're working with our customer services team currently to identify as they make calls to us um, that we determine that they are actually a commercial property and that we need we need to be charging them the full the full rent on it. Um, I'm not sure that they'd be totally forthcoming um, because we're going to be because we want to charge them the full amount of the collection and disposal. So actually, it's more about how we identify that when they're ringing to bulk to book that service with us, that they are a commercial service and that they should be paying the full fee rather than just the householder fee. I'm just worried that that might put some people off and result in more fly tipping if they think oh I've got to pay the full amount I'll just not that they would but they might just think it's easier to dump it unfortunately I mean across across the board we are um we're in difficult times aren't we um mm. they are a commercial business these holiday lets are earning huge amounts of money and this well, year the going moment. forwards <laughs> well, this year going forwards will be earning yeah. huge amounts of money um and you know legally they should they should be paying for those services okay. if they dump it obviously we have an enforcement team who would would try to um, determine that but i would think the vast majority of people who own those holiday lets are, are going to be responsible okay thank you indeed right okay do we have any further comments i i just wanted um for the benefit of the clerk, I, I just wanted to um, put forward uh, a recommendation that the executive consider uh, my proposal of a two weekly collection with option two. Um, that might not fa find favour in the committee, um, but uh, I would like to put it forward as a recommendation. Um, I understand that there's operational costs, but I still have the overriding concern about waste sitting in householders' bins for three weeks and thinking that's probably just a week too far. So if we can put that as a recommendation and we'll just have to vote on it accordingly. Um, any other recommendations? Sorry, Councillor Hewitt. Well, um, basically, I'd like to recommend that... Um, the executive explore a disposal solution for um, for smelly waste, you know, for personal waste like nappies or medical stuff. I mean, that's really my only concern. I mean, I, in terms of three weekly collection is, is those two things. So that's, I'd sort of alter your recommendation a bit, Councillor Lester, and just say it's it's the nappies and the medical waste that's the concern yeah i think i think um i still think they're separate uh, potentially separate simply because of the volume of waste that is generated by a family you know i understand the idea about trying to minimize waste in the first place so that you don't have a lot of waste but i i still think the uh, the three week issue is going to be a problem but um, Councillor Hewitt, I, I, I think your point about um, waste with where people are concerned about it um, for various reasons, I, I think that could be its own recommendation. Um, Councillor Stark and then Councillor Davis. Bearing in mind, Councillor Davis has to leave shortly. Yeah. Um, no, my recommendation is to have a unified waste strategy with an aim to provide an end-to-end -end waste service for residents. And that, in a way, Chairman, precedes whether we consider your uh, proposal or even Councillor Hewitt's proposal. Because by looking at how we're going to provide a unified strategy and an end-to-end -end service, some of those issues may very well flow from that that we haven't considered up to now. And Councillor Davis has said that the thinking is still going on there. 
So while your recommendation may be okay at the moment, I'm not sure whether the new thinking might actually um, overtake that and, and it may mean that we might come up with other options. I don't know if Councillor Davis would want to comment on that. Councillor Davis. Yeah, um, yeah, I was going to go down the same route, really, Councillor Stark, is that I think it does precede it, um, the recommendation that you've just put forward, which I'm more than happy to take on. Um, the concern that I have around the particular Councillor Lester's recommendation is that we've already gone out to consultation with members of the public, and had they have known that there was a different element of collection of residual waste, they may have chosen a different option. So I think it fundamentally flaws the consultation process, which I wouldn't be keen on doing because we had a really good response rate. And I think it looks like we're maybe trying to do our own thing, even though the consultation said something else. So it's just that concern that I've got around it that the consultations already had, but more than happy with the recommendation from Councillor Stark that may actually solve, solve both Councillor Hewitt and Councillor Lester's um, recommendations. Right, any other recommendations? No, okay then. Well, I think at this point in the meeting, Councillor Davis, we're going to mull over the recommendations that we've had from the previous item and this one, and uh, and then we'll be voting on them accordingly. And obviously as part of the executive, you'll be notified of those recommendations. So feel free to leave us if, if, if as and when you, you, you do, um, but uh, we will now ask the clerk to go through them, the recommendations. Um, Councillor Bowes first. Sorry, Chair, I was just wondering why Councillor Davis was here. Did we want to, because she put forward an option for the a task and finish group on littering? I know she's only got a few minutes left, but would it be worth her speaking on what her um, anticipated task and finish group would do? That, that might excellent, uh, excellent idea. Councillor Davis, did you want to say that before you have to leave? Yeah, no, I'd be really grateful for that, actually. I was just about to pop off and have a cup of tea, but it's fine. The tea shall wait. Um, the Just a query. Uh, just, I think we've all seen the Herculean efforts of the Purple Bag Brigades around Herefordshire um, and how wonderful it is to see that happening. However, the waste continues to be there. Um, the litter still continues to happen. We still have issues around... Um, takeaways and it being strewn across the county and something needs to be done so the when I've spoken to the community volunteer group they said absolutely they are happy to go and pick up waste and I know a number of councillors do it as well um, but they need to see something done from the council and I think that this is where scrutiny could play an amazing part um, I think that there are three strands that we need to look at. So firstly, is around about where are we placing our bins? Are we placing the right type of bins in the right place? So that's one side of it. The one is around the dispose. I know that it, it links in with this waste strategy. What about our disp deposit return schemes? Could we look at bringing them forward quicker to try and ha encourage people to get rid of their waste in a different way where they're paid to get rid of their waste? Um, around the education of members of the public, including schools, which used to happen all the time. And again, we talked about officer resource earlier, is a key example. When, we, when you get rid of posts, this is the impact that it has. So what can we do about the education going into schools? And finally, more importantly at the moment, I think, is around that enforcement. We, I know that Nicola and Ben will be acutely aware of how few enforcement officers we have available to deal with littering um, and antisocial behaviour. And I think that recommendations could come from this scrutiny committee that identify if a resource is needed and at what level to enable that to happen. So those are the main tiers of what I was thinking about um, and happy for you guys to all uh, discuss it now whilst I leave. Councillor Stark. Um, yes, just before Councillor Davis goes, what about dog waste? I mean, I have tried to get an enforcement officer from time to time to look at the hot spots, if I can call it that, in, in my ward. And it's just as big a problem, if not more, than litter. And I don't know whether it would be too much to ask the TNF group to look at both, but it was just a suggestion. Yeah, I would. I, I, I guess that's for you all to decide. But I absolutely am in, in agreement with you. Um, dog waste and the 
the issues that it can cause for human health is so big and I just don't understand I still can't understand why people put dog poo in black bin bags and then in dog poo bags and then hang them from trees it's if you can you know it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever so you've done half of the batter but you can't do the final bit um so yeah I, I mean I personally would love that to be in there but it's down to you as a committee as to whether you think that's too big okay and, and obviously to human health and to animal health uh, can have massive consequences for uh, livestock right um okay thank you councillor davis for that contribution and uh, yes i think you'll find the committee is going to be keen to uh, set that in motion councillor hewitt um i'd just like to comment that um in my observation the sites that are um most littered are those around large um, economic establishments, sort of large em employment establishments, so that you know they're getting deliveries and stuff's being thrown out of delivery lorries. I mean, I'm not going to point the finger at any one person in particular, but I'm just wondering whether there could be any exploration as to mm. um, you know site-specific responsibility, so that management on in particular large employment sites says okay we have a litter problem which is making our um, employee area look disgraceful and everybody has to contribute in, in some way or another I mean those sort of options to be explored because that's where I see most litter in the hedgerows leading up to certain big employment sites that I know of in my area. I have to say, Councillor Hewitt, I'm, uh, when I've been doing litter picks in the ward I represent, it's really very, very rural and I'm and there's no one around. And I'm astonished to find so much waste. You can fill a black bag in, in 20 minutes. And so whether it's via an economic centre or not, I think, I think it's, it's a massive problem across the board, shall I say. Um, the leader of the council would like to have a word. Um, Councillor Hitchner, over to you. Just to apologise that uh, I also must leave, but uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you for your attendance. Uh, yeah. Councillor Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Just following up on a couple of things that have been said there. Um, with regard to having more enforcement for litter, waste and dog fouling, um, I have found that it would be far better to have people employed by the council directly and not in, uh, direct employees of the council i.e people coming in on a, with their specific role of uh, enforcing because that leads to disrepute, disrepute uh, when they get overzealous and it's all been documented before so it's about having people who are employed by the council directly and another way that we can address uh, with regards to litter waste is is going um, straight to the shops themselves mcdonald's Kentucky Fried Chickens and having words in the ear and there are models out there that I believe can address people discarding their own food containers. Thank you. Yes, but to, to make the point, it's the it's the individual's wastes, not the um, business's waste that ends. It, it's, it's the it's the customer who um, yeah. ends up putting the waste in the uh, hedgerow, not not the company itself. Um, noted. Right. Um, I think we need to uh, just steer back to the fact that uh, we've got these recommendations uh, in two parts: one for the first, but the um, first task and finish group, and then the second task and finish group. So. Mr. Brown, can you tell us the, the damage? How many recommendations have we got as a, as a, as a result of having spent three hours on the matter? I haven't, I, I haven't counted them, Chairman. If we can just probably about 16 or 17, I would think, if I can share them. Um, struggling on the waste ones, to be honest, but um, obviously got a fair few on the um, climate emergency as well. So if I can just share that now, perhaps, and see sure. how we go. Yeah. So I don't know if that's if that's sharing now. Yeah. Yes, that's working. Right. So um, we start off with um, uh, about two or three overarching ones on the 
uh, climate review, which I hope gives effect to what the committee wanted. So I'll let you have a look through those unless you want, unless you wish me to read them. No. Yep, that all makes perfect sense to me. Nodding heads. So the second one, yep. Yep. Okay, um, third. Yeah, the general point about resources. Was... Yep. And then, and then and we then... come on, on to the specific ones, if that's okay, so. Yep. Yeah. So, Councillor Hewitt's point about yeah. getting on with the list. Yeah. Do you want to call them out one by one, Chairman? Perhaps if you so. Yeah, so 19. Everyone yeah. focus on 19. If I don't hear anything, we'll move on. Yeah. And there's um, another recommendation. I don't yeah. understand this one with the question mark against it, Tim. Can you? Yeah, uh, this may have been this may have been overtaken by um, by your by your one on nineteen now. So if, that, okay. if you, if you okay. want that taken out, yeah, so I take that out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then similarly, it was around that point as, but as to whether it's um, this was this link with the environment agency and the notes from their meetings. I think that that should be left in. I think that's really important for the public because otherwise we've got no idea as to how we're moving forward. Yeah, Didn't I think you say that it be... could be taken to the minerals and waste, that the abbreviated minutes could be taken to the minerals and waste? Meeting. No, to the, it, it wasn't. It was to the Nutrient Management Board. Yeah, Nutrient Sorry, Management yes. Board. Yeah. Um, number two. Number, yeah. Do you want included in the... Um, uh, Chairperson summary at the Nutrient Management Board or something. NMB um, yeah. agenda papers or something like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, the, the, the next one again, I'm not sure that's still live. That was your point, Councillor Hewitt, about you know the neighbourhood planning aspects. Yeah. I my, well personally, I think that that still stands because. Um, as far as I could tell from the evidence we were giving back, they don't at the moment require parish councils to give them feedback about what parts of the CE they've been able to been able to um, implement, shall we say. So I think it's still helpful, that one. Does it, what does the committee feel? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think 22 went by the wayside and we went to, then to 30D, which was this business about the sustainable verge management, which the yeah. cabinet member was willing to pursue. But yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I would be more um, forceful there, Tim. I mean, I would say that they, they should not only reconsider the rejection of this one, but they should be proactive in promoting um, contact between Monmouthshire and the parishes in terms of how um, good practice can be uh, built upon in Edfordshire. Well, we don't really need Monmouthshire because we've got Verging on Wild and they're already... Well, well, whichever one it would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind, uh, Councillor Hewitt, could... which one we use, yeah. I think, yeah, I think Verging, on Her the Verging one was... Yeah. Verging on Wild, who are already working with yeah. um, whatever his name is, Grogan, Spencer Grogan at BBLP. Um, and made, they've made considerable progress, actually. And, you know, basically they're um, a charitable organisation and I'm sure that they would deliver a, a webinar for all parish councils to access. So, okay. yeah. so is that sufficient as it stands now? Is that... Yeah. Well, would we... Would we, would we just make the comment about groups within Herefordshire that could promote such things rather than mentioning a specific organisation, just, just in case there are other organisations that may help. 
it, it probably would fall to one particular organization, but you know, just to make it so that it's open to all. The, th the thing about Verging on Wild is that, you know, whereas, you know, things like the um, Herefordshire Meadows or the Wildlife Trust or whatever, with whom they have a lot of interaction, they specifically work on roadside verges and have a lot of expertise in that area through people like Plant Life. And so I, I'd like to keep BOW in there because they have, they have really worked their socks off and, you know, they're worth their... Uh, worth yeah. their weight in gold <laughs> no don't, don't don't doubt it but i was just wanting to yeah when you when you always name individual groups it's it's potentially at the cost of missing somebody else out that was all yeah, yeah. I think it, that reads well now tim yeah okay yeah. thank you that's right yeah okay so 32 b leave that in that's vital Yes, yeah, so I was just wondering whether that was sufficient to encapsulate Councillor what, uh, Hewitt's and my concerns about the overall effect of it. I mean, greater clarification on how it works would be welcome, but uh, we were making a general point about... Mm. I mean, I mean, one option there would be, is, is it, do you want um, a, a briefing note for members of the committee? Would that be an option, Chairman, there, perhaps? Yeah. Well, a briefing note, but I honestly think we need a briefing note for the public because, you know, we're doing this work on the public's behalf. And I don't think half of them would understand what on earth we're talking about, about a phosphate trading platform. And, and I think that there was some concession from Ben that, that it, sort of, it has its dangers. You know, it's, it's a Hobson's choice, really. And I did, think well, Mr. Boswell's got his hand up. So, did you want to help us with this recommendation? Yeah, sorry, I, I don't wish to intrude when I, I shouldn't on your recommendations. I guess what I was going to say is, you know, we have commissioned the development of, of that, and we're, we'll be publishing it. You know, we should be receiving that next month, and we'll be publishing it next month. So, it will be going on the website with all the details around it when it's done. I guess regarding your your recommendation, as you said, is that. Um, some, is it a, a sort of a very quick update and outline of, of the proposal and where it is, or is it more detailed later? I guess I'm just trying to understand at what stage that's helpful because um, next month we will have it with all the full details and I can go through it in much more detail. We'd probably probably end up doing some tutorials and, and guidance on how to use it. Um, okay, okay. So, so would it be something like greater clarification about the process, the, about, the, about the proposal? is provided so that it gives members and members of the public um, more information as to assess the merits of it or something like that. Uh, because that's what we're really, what well, we have concerns, but if greater information can clarify things or allay fears, then maybe people's views would be different on the matter. Perhaps, Ben, I don't know whether this is possible. Could it be an open session that, um, you know, either is on, you know, publicly viewable that, so that people could comment or that the public were invited to um, participate in? A bit like, well, the Nutrient Management Board, you can elect to come and participate, can't you, as a member of the public? Um, sorry, I jumping in. Or potentially, I mean, I guess another alternative could be to do that through the uh, neutral management board, and that would be another way of capturing it in a public forum. But um, I think, I suppose, I don't, I don't wish to influence your recommendation. I was just trying to no, no. understand. I think through the nutrient management board would be a good place, but I also think a briefing for members would be good. So perhaps both. Mm. Okay, so that 32 P B, it could read greater clarification to be provided on the operation of a phosphate to be provided to, as a briefing to councillors and through the forum of the nutrient management board. Um, so after provided to. So, so, so you don't want it on the website now? Well, I mean, as a result, it could go on the website. You don't want something on the website. You want something on the website to be. Um, okay. 
maybe at the end of the process. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and as an item on the nutrient management board, as an agenda uh, item. Um, uh, and merits of the proposal being reviewed by the nutrient management board. Yeah. Yep. Reviewed. Yeah. And okay, thank you. You could uh, leave the um, this to be added to the website in due course, um, Con or conclusions yeah. to be added to the website in due course. It's, sorry, just wait a minute. Uh, Maybe you should put the CEE website. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I just need to. Sorry, I'm just going to be. Is that okay now? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. okay. So, yeah, so I think so. I think thirty-three. Oh no, I think no. that's that's overtaken now, isn't it? I think is that right? I think that's overtaken. I think we covered that further up. Yeah, we yeah, have. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. I've got some wording for forty-one, Tim. I've been playing. Okay, do you want to, can you add to what's there or is that um, to the, the, the detail or, yeah. It's, uh, uh, I thought, work undertaken in conjunction with the transport team to undertake surveys with schools to identify barriers and opportunities for active travel, full survey commence and report back with opportunities and recommendations by November. Do you want me to um, yeah, please. type yeah. it? Well, yeah, type Email it and then everybody can look at it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think everybody got the gist of that uh, as Councillor Bose read it out. Yeah. Don't forget. Yeah, 54 is quite straightforward yeah, try, try, <coughs> with regards try, to the Article 4. Try, so don't forget after November 2021. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just in November case. 2021. Just in case. I can't shrink at the minute. It won't let me shrink it to type it. Right, that's the um, first working group's recommendations reviewed and uh, no executive response reviewed. So we've just got... Um, I was going to say, Chairman, do you want to... If, if, you, if there's consensus on that, um, you know, do you need to go to an electronic vote or are you content to say that there's a unanimous consent to those, you know, for the climate section and then move on to the waste section? Yes. I mean, in all of um, our discussions, nobody disagreed with any of the points that were raised um, of focus. So I think it, unless I hear different from the committee members, everybody's in agreement with all of the progressing, all of those recommendations. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so on, on to waste, and uh, I confess that I'm struggling here, Chairman. So no, no, okay. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll not quite we'll blank sheet, but, yeah. And that's it. So you know, these were just attempts, really. So. Yes, uh, Tim, under two, I was talking about a unified waste strategy. Sorry, yep. Unified waste strategy would be would be um, drawn up by the executive. Right. Be drawn up by the executive with a name to provide an end-to-end -end waste service oh, sorry. for residents from, uh, for residents, well, you could say spanning from repair and reuse, spanning from repair and reuse. right through to collection and disposal. Thanks, Tim. Um, what did we mean by greater clarity as to recycling? Oh, right. That's right. Yes. So that was my recommendation, I think, or my concern that we needed to have a fuller understanding about what happens to recycled waste. Yeah, uh, didn't um, Councillor Davis say like a map so it, it shows you exactly where your bit of item is going? Yeah. In like a flow. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I'm not sure whether you've got it listed further down, but I think one of the key things that we teased out as a committee first off was our um, the need to ensure that the maximum amount of waste doesn't find itself in in landfill um, okay. so I think um, a recommendation there that is saying any new contract maximizes the opportunities to avoid landfill to the greatest extent or so, something like that I think to to specifically talk about 1% or 2% or 5% or whatever is presents its own challenge, but the maximum amount or maximize as, as Tim. Ben, you wanted to come in? Sorry. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, it was just uh, a bit of a heads up. I think Nicola needs to leave at about half past 11, uh, sorry, half 11, half past one uh, for another meeting on sure. um, some Understood. of the issues we're, we're talking about, actually. Um, so just, just to say if that's okay. Sorry, I didn't know how to interrupt. <laughs> Just raise your hand. So is, is that is that sufficient then? Any new contracts maximise the scope to reduce waste to landfill? Is that sufficient? Yep. Yep. Jonathan, can I just say um, yep. the um, any new contract should maximise the scope to re oh, no, no no greater clarity as to what happens to recycled waste. Yeah. I think we were actually talking about household waste in general so for instance we do need to know as members of the public um what any waste generated where it goes so it's not just about recycled waste yes um i th th there's two strands to this i think you're absolutely right that it's all waste my yes. concern is though that when people think that waste is being recycled, they, they think, great, the problem's been solved and yeah. they don't have to worry about it. But I think there needs to be greater clarity about how waste is being recycled, because if it's not necessarily the positive outcome that people think it is, then that might encourage reuse. Yeah. 
I think is the, the general point. And I think greater awareness across the board of what happens to waste, whether it's reusable, recyclable or residual, um, I think would be a great thing for members of the public to get more information about. And Chair, you should, we should take the two together because any new contract should maximise the scope to reduce waste to landfill. We are signalling very strongly that when it comes to residual waste, we're not expecting that to be going to landfill anyway. So, so there's a link between the two, the two recommendations. It shouldn't be seen in isolation. No, absolutely. But, but I think it would be good to have... My own view is that it would be good to have separate recommendations so that they can be addressed with equal footing. Um, so just to come back, Chairman, so you've got the one on um, greater, greater clarity as to what happens to recycled waste generated. Is that greater information and clarity on what happens to all waste? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yep. Then you've got the contract. And then there's a, an attempt to address the nappy question. <laughs> I don't know if that's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, can we have the music switch off, please? Yeah. Thank you. And then I think um, six and ten were the whole of the um, those were requests for information, which I think were both addressed by the cabinet member and officers. If that's all right, yeah, yeah. And this is your this is your point on the um, three weekly and or not yes. waste. And yeah. I fully accept the point been made about the consultations already been done, but um, I still think there's the potential for an issue with waste, uh, three weekly uh, waste. So members of the committee can either agree to it, disagree with it, what have you, but I would still like that recommendation to be put in there, to yeah. be put to the meeting. I mean, do you want to take an informal sounding on that one, Chairman, now, or and then decide whether to put it needs to be put to the vote? What do you feel? Or do you want to put that? Well, there, there are people who might disagree with it, so I think it's one of those that has to go to the vote. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Ben Boswell, you would like to come in? Oh, sorry, I've still got my hand up. Um, oh, sorry. You... There you go. Yeah. Um, recommend, uh, recommendation 15, I think uh, I, uh, there's talk about it, but I don't think, to my recollection, anything specific came of that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That was, that's the... Um... Uh, Tim, that was picked up in the Unified Waste Strategy. Okay. okay. Um, and then... Um, and 22 was this um, point you were making about um, the opportunity for the public to recycle material. But again, the cabinet member suggested that that was being dealt with. But I don't know if you so wish something to be registered there. Well, I think the, the only thing, I mean, it, it depends on the site we're talking about. But I know there's ample room in somewhere like Lempster for people yeah. to just walk up to a container and say, oh, if nobody wants that, I can have that. And I don't think Bromyard is that constrained. Um, I can't, from memory, I can't think about Ross. Can we just say to encourage the executive to continue to explore? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think. <clears throat> and then stress this bit about members of the public rather than it just being ring-fenced to charities. Yeah. I think the point about charities is that something that members of the public might be able to fix, charities don't necessarily have yeah. the expertise to do. Absolutely, or the, or the volunteers to cope with the... It, it, makes, that... it makes me wonder, we've got these market trading on-site platforms that um, are about selling um, second-hand goods. I just wondered whether, rather than waiting until it gets to the actual... Um, site itself, whether there could be any sort of online platform that could be used for people to say, I've got moment. this piece of waste, can, is someone interested in picking it up for free, for example? There, there are some um, council stock on Facebook, there are some groups like that already, Free Cycle and I can't remember the other one I'm a member of, that just says, do you want this, it's for free. Um. Nicola, you wanted to come in, sorry, before you have to leave. 
Yeah, and um, just the word recycle there um, mm. generally <laughs> means the the reproduction yes. of a product. So reuse reuse yeah reuse reuse yeah. let somebody else have the use of yeah. is it is, is that sufficient as it now stands chairman yeah i, th I think so yep okay, so i think uh, and i think that's um i think that's the end that's that's yeah that's the end of that's the end of those recommendations yeah okay so as i say i think that there may be um debate about my recommendation about well, number 13, let's call it. Yeah. Um, so we may have to vote about that. But again, I think we've got consensus on all the others. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Tim, would you yes. stop sharing? I think I can type my recommendation. Press yeah, escape. Press escape, Thank Tracy. You. Yeah. Tracy, press escape and you can then type. Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. But don't escape just yet. <laughs> no, I'll try not to. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, while we're waiting, Chair, I think the one concern I've got about recommendation 13 is the environmental impact. I think what, what what I was conscious of in looking at the options for waste collection was how many lorries you might need and, and how much that might have an impact in terms of the actual service itself producing its own carbon emissions. And I think the, mo the more frequency that you offer a collection, the more there's going to be an impact on CO2 emissions. So I think that's one of my concerns. Yes, I accept that. It's always going to be a trade-off, isn't it? And, and one of the concerns I have is the potential environmental impact or the impact on the immunity of residents by allowing waste to accrue for three weeks. So it, 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 there's a balance there to be struck. And um, I, I just think the logistics of, of bin maintenance, it may cause certain people a problem. I understand, and I think it was a really important point to throw into the mix, the idea that you know, Nicola had said to us that not everybody is on these systems where it's just not practical, different situations apply, and that's important, but we are talking about the large majority of households, so that's something to bear in mind. So, Councillor Durkin and then Councillor Bo uh, Mr. Boswell. Thank you. Ben, a question for you. Um, we were talking about this item 13. Is it, is it possible to get vehicles that will, can take plastics, etc., cetera, and um, paper, etc., cetera, in, on the same vehicle? Um, yes, thanks for looking at it. It is. It's, what you end up doing there is if you're having vehicles with different compartments in they can collect them differently so i suppose that's part of what we looked at with the other option really with the um uh you could have a refuse bin that maybe has half and half and lifter on one side that might take the one and one to take the other the problem is then you've got less capacity within that and you might fill one up before the other one so you'd need to then go and empty and then it, it it's the logistics within all of that as well. So, I mean, that's part of what was considered. So, yeah. no, I understand. And my, my thoughts were that it, it, it could uh, assist with the situation with regard to two and three week deliveries of residual waste. That's all. If, it, if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. Yeah. Well, I say it is, it is, it is feasible. It's just different and it would have higher costs and higher carbon. And, and it was, I suppose, looked at at the, at the outset, I believe. Um, I mean, the other thing that I was going to say actually is that for, for residents who do have large families and, and nappies, we do offer larger bins as well, which is something we, we didn't mention earlier or didn't discuss. So we do have the larger recycling bins and the, the larger black bins that are offer where people do have you know, that need for additional capacity. So that is something that's currently offered and that would be reviewed in however our collection service looked. So we would still make those kind of accommodations. <clears throat> but I think the general yeah. point is... If it's not mentioned now, 
Um, when is it going to be mentioned? And better to mention it now than uh, mention it when the system's up and running and may cause problems. So, um, what about what about asking for consideration um, if a mixed mixed vehicle would that be appropriate, Ben? Call it a mixed vehicle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be part of how you design your service spec. So, I suppose you know, say, say we we'd pick a, a collection service. That this is what this is what we want collected for the public. We then go out to tender. We could either design it to really high levels of detail, but then, uh, or you can get the market to come to you with their proposals and innovations of how to do that. So we would consider that, and I guess it, it then just depends on how you, you go to tender after taking those decisions. Really. Okay. So if, if we if we set you a, a mixed non residual vehicle. Well, I, I, I think I think the problem with that is you're talking about the operational solution to it rather than the principle of it, and you, you well, might want, you you might confuse the two. The, po the the simple point is just reconsider the proposal so that you retain a two weekly system under yeah. option two. Just leave it at that. How the how the solution would manifest itself to achieve that is obviously a, a an operational issue. My concern is, as as Gemma said, that we've already gone out to consultation on this, and now to change it could could imply that we've not really listened to what they've said, and now come up with their own solution. So I'd rather, I don't know what everybody else thinks, vote on that one. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I appreciate that. But Tracy, um, even worse that um, that we had, uh, you know, another hidden. Um, set of choices mm. that weren't presented to people, which I think, you know, I can't, and, and for me, it's the carbon footprint as well. So, um, and the, the principal things is that we've got to educate the public to reduce their waste and the carbon footprint and the consultancy. So I, I can't go with that recommendation, Jonathan, well intended as it was, sorry. Yep, I understand that. But as I say, <laughs> we need to put forward these recommendations because if they're not thrashed out here, where are they thrashed out? Right, okay. So we have one, in the second tranche of recommendations to do with waste, we have one that needs to be voted upon and the others I think we've all got consensus on. So if we can agree to all of those ones that we've got consensus on and vote on the last one, I think we've got all of our recommendations sorted. So, can we go over to the vote with regard to recommendation 13? Uh, Chem, would we be able to have a verbal vote on this one? Yes, okay, yeah, absolutely. So all those in favor, <laughs> all against. What's, what's the what's the question? Sorry. Can we put the wording up? Sorry, uh, Tim, of uh, thirteen. Sorry, Tim, you're on mute. Um. Uh, it was just um, straight. It was just straightforwardly um, consideration be given to fortnightly collection of black bin waste rather than three weekly in pursuing option two. Councillor Dirk, can you clear on that? Yeah, okay, so I'm in favour. Councillor Durkin is in favour, and those against? Three. So two in favour, three against, so that recommendation is lost. Thank you. And all the other recommendations are approved. Okay, well, thank you to officers. Um, thank you to Mr Boswell and Mr Vaughan and all the other officers that have contributed. Um, lots covered there, really important. A lot of work and a lot of work still to do. And the moral of the story is something's not necessarily rejected. It's just noted and there are things, there's more work to be done. So I think we've, we've learned that uh, the council needs to phrase things slightly differently in its clarification of where we're at with certain things. But uh, thank you to the committee for, for helping us iron out that. Mr. Boswell, you wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. Sorry to... Um... While you're wrapping up, I just wondered with the, uh, the talk of the work program and litter, are we still on picking? Is that a separate item or is that part yes, of it this is, one? Yes, ah, okay. yes it is. Yeah. So moving seamlessly on then to the next item on the agenda, which is the work program. Um, 
we have um, the next meeting is the 5th of Ju June, 11th of June, sorry, 11th of yeah. June. Not entirely clear on whether a new scrutiny structure will be in place or not. Doesn't look as though it will be, but we'll just feel our way to the next meeting. But to have a look at the, does anybody have any general comments about the work programme, Councillor Stark? Yes, um, I, I raised with the uh, term in an email uh, the fact that we hadn't had the opportunity to scrutinise the council's response to the pandemic. I'm just conscious that the longer it goes on and the more that the context changes, that we are missing an opportunity to really do that at the time yeah. when it would be best to do it. And I, I really do think we should do it at the next meeting at all costs yes. if we can. I, I agree, and there seems to... It seems to be different views on what that investigation should be, but I seem to remember back in May 2020, it was just a matter of how's the council doing, you know, uh, in many different ways. How are they delivering services? What have the pressures been? Is there anything that could have been done better? You know, what's working well? These are just the general questions that I think we could assess as a scrutiny committee. Um, and, and that needs to be done. Um, and we'll be, it will be an opportunity for the scrutiny committee to commend some of the great actions that the council's done and, and an opportunity to reflect on what could be done be better in, 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 and what, so, the, Clark, you've got your hand up, sorry. Yeah, um, Chairman, as I say, I think, um, I know the matter has been, well, I have lodged the matter with relevant officers, but I have had some feedback as to you know, precisely what it is the committee is asking for. Um, what I wondered is, can I, um, you know, put together what, you know, the wording that we have at the moment is listed in the work programme. But if I, if I can email around the committee and, you know, make sure that, you know, we've got encapsulated precisely what the committee wants and then I can forward that um, again to seek an item. Um, I must say that um, from the exchanges that I've had in recent weeks and months indeed um, I, I would expect that it, it will be unlikely in the current situation that you'll get a report for June to be honest but um, that can certainly be requested but I've got to be honest with you that that's my uh, impression as things stand. Okay, well then perhaps the, I mean, I looked to the committee for their advice, but perhaps it's, you know, the, the misunderstanding is, I don't know why it's been generated because all that the committees I understood are asking for is the council delivers a whole host of services. How have those services been delivered in the face of the COVID uh, pandemic? and how have things gone as a result? I don't think it was anything greater than that. Um, so I'm not quite clear on why there was a, a misunderstanding as to what that really entailed. And so all I would offer, you know, all I would say as chair is that I would reiterate that request um, as, as Councillor Starker said, and we just need to have a, a look at how the council's done you know, what it's done during this COVID crisis. Um, and, and, and I think it's particularly important because, you know, moving out of the crisis, when you consider the impact on people who've been ill or the hospitals or schools, particularly in children, uh, will then be ongoing implications for what we've got to pick up as a council afterwards. And that's it. I'm more concerned with really. Absolutely, and, and another example would be certain members of staff, I won't go into specifics, but certain members of staff were redeployed from one service to another in order to cope. Well, what impact did that have on the service that they weren't doing? Yeah. And we just need to know what happened as a result of that. Yeah. Um, and, and so those are things that we can assess so that as a committee, we can assess the impact of, of COVID. Um, and we could have done that months and months and months ago. So um, I put that, I mean, it all goes through the, the clerk, but I put that challenge back to officers that that's the type of thing that we want to assess. Yeah, 
Um, Chairman, as I said, if I can come back to you with some wording that we can then yeah. put around the committee and make sure that that encompasses what everyone wants. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then we've got all the other um, issues on the work programme. Anybody like to add anything to that? Chancellor Hewitt? There are two things, and I'm just being a pain, I know, but... <laughs> Um, so to go back to the recommendations, we've just voted on them, and I think maybe I, I wouldn't be able to um, add anything to the waste management strategy, but I remember us having long conversations about how useful it would be to engage in a proactive way with NMITE for considering what businesses could be encouraged to um, grow as a result of reuse and recycling, recycling maybe, so to look at um, you know, um, encouraging technology explorations in the students of NMI to, to manage our waste so that, mm -hmm. so that we had a progressive procurement policy so that the businesses that, re, you know, re, reuse the waste happened in this county and created business opportunities and growth for this county. So... We, we, we do have the progress with NMITE on the on And maybe the we could pick it up there. We could yep. pick it up there. Yeah, okay, sorry. So the second thing was, is that I really seriously want us to review the whistleblowing policy in the council, please. Okay, so if we can add that to the work programme. I'm not, I'm not sure, Chairman, if Chairman, if that might be... Oh, is audit that audit and governance? It might be audit and governance matter, but um, I can check. Can we seek clarification on that point, yep. please? Yep. Yeah, yep. okay, okay. And then I wanted, um, I'm not sure if it's already in there, sorry, I've lost my page numbering now, um, to do with the Police and Crime Commissioner. Yeah, yep, that's on there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. And um, we will get a, an appointed crime and Police and Crime Commissioner after a couple of weeks' time. Councillor Stark? Um, I set in the fire authority, and the, there's a bigger issue there, which is about the present incumbent wanting to combine the governance of both police and fire service. And I do think as a council with six representatives on the existing fire authority, Herefordshire and Worcestershire, we may want to do that sooner rather than later to look at that. Yep. Um, yeah, just, just to just to add, um, the, 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 the committee did look at this, I think, possibly prior to the last election. I, I appreciate things have moved on, on since then, Councillor Stark, but um, you know, that has been considered once by the committee. Um, and I think the other thing, Chairman, is I, I got the impression that you were content for um, uh, a task and finish group to be established um, on the litter uh, yes. in response to the litter request, yeah. um, rather than go into um, details the detail now if you're content for me to explore that with members of the committee with a view yes, to a report coming back to the next meeting with a scoping statement yeah yes please yeah Thank you. yeah i think that would be really positive right is there anything else if not thank you all for your participation um as a little it looked like um, not a lot on the agenda but there was a lot of ground covered there um and some really important um catch up on some very key issues for the council. So I thank the committee for all of their contributions, working hard as always. And uh, thank you to the officers for staying the distance and making your contributions. And lastly to uh, Tim, who's got the, uh, who's in the engine room, making sure the committee is going in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. Can I ask for the 